how many fucking NFTs do you have now? I. <laughs> it's a, it's an embarrassing question to answer. <laughs> but like I've been messing around with those um, since since they were a, a thing that was fairly simple and easy to to get right. Like yeah. um, I made. Um, we won't dignify them by calling them investments with a capital I, but uh, before it was called aping, I I aped into things like um, uh, uh, the Augmenters ICO, where it's a game on the Bitcoin blockchain where you battle 3D kind of beasts against each other. And so I have a... Um, I have a rookie token NFT on the Bitcoin blockchain, which uh, uh, when the project failed, um, it became represented just by, you know, the signature on the uh, yeah. all but obsolete counterparty wallet that shows that I have this this rookie token that will never look like a cool 3D beast and do cool moves. Oh, <laughs> and sucks. it started then and it just kind of balloons out um, to, to all sorts of... Uh, all sorts of stuff. And some of it is, you know, just p- kind of playing the the greater fool Ponzi game. Some of it I actually like, though. I mean, um, people have made me some NFTs in my <laughs> avatar image. And it's... Uh, yeah, I saw that. That was actually... Uh, uh, so didn't somebody do a, a punk of you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think a couple of people did, cool. actually. Yeah. I'm, I mean, it, whatever gets people inspired to like iterate even if the apple isn't falling far from the tree that's kind of just what what art is and even though like uh the the actual meat and potatoes of what an nft is doesn't add a whole lot to the art it's yeah it's inspiring people to like at least move their imagination that way like oh it would be cool if this was an art a piece of art on the blockchain and there was only one of one of it and you know maybe it gained some va- or had a chance to gain some value i think that's i think that's really all it is is it lets people sort of be adjacent to participating in a market for their art that's um this kind of a venue that artists didn't necessarily have before right and i that's all that's kind of all all that i really like is that uh the ability to do something new whether or not it actually has value like you can at least try well, I mean, especially for digital artists, because I was I went to school for filmmaking and photography on actual negatives and thirty five millimeter film and sixteen millimeter film. Oh wow! And I feel like that had you had a tangible object at that point, and if somebody wanted it, they had to go through you to get a copy of that negative. Yeah, or a print of that negative. And then when I switched over into digital, I I feel like the work I'm making is a thousand times better, but. I feel like it's just so easy for anybody just to steal it if they want to, and then and then it loses value. Whereas the blockchain, I feel like at least I can say, no, no, you have an original copy now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I like the idea of that. And I like the idea of somebody says, you know what, I want to sell this, that I can say, you know what, I'm going to take 15%. Or I have, a, I have a project up right now called 99% where I get 99% of the profit of the sale. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. This is a joke. Just because it's like, you know, fuck you people who have been commodifying art at the at, at artist expenses. Fuck yeah. you. Yeah. So that's that's it. I'm gonna I'm gonna take ninety nine percent if it sells. I mean, it's it's just like four words on a on a, on the screen. <laughs> just kind of as a joke. But like seriously, if it sells, I'll get ninety nine percent of the sell. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? Like the the freedom to experiment with that is is totally fine like i i feel like there's there's kind of like an open permissionlessness kind of pass to to do weird stuff even though your your 99 experiment is okay if someone's like kind of foolish enough to buy this for the for the lulls or for whatever reason right like yeah it, it doesn't make you a scammer or anything it makes you an experimenter in a market context where somebody decided to participate you with uh, with participate with you for whatever reason yeah and you know um and they're not and they're not getting scammed because they're buying a piece of artwork that they were interested in right they chose to buy it right it'd only right. be a scam if i if i didn't give it to them 
Yeah. Well, there, there's other ways you can scam with NFTs too. And some of it's, I, I, I got into it with, um, with a, a Bitcoiner, kind of the other, well, the other night, actually, it was up really late, just kind of slinging um, with, uh, with a, with a, a, a full on like a hardline Bitcoiner who's actually a wallet developer. So he knows like a lot more um, uh, about the Bitcoin vertical than I do. And he was, um, he was very condescending to me, which is fine. Um, but hold the, hold the phone, a Bitcoiner <laughs> condescending. No, I refuse to accept that premise. <laughs> That is well, impossible. Uh, well, well, refuse to accept it, but let's proceed as though it were the the truth. And uh, but he was telling me a lot about like why um, why NFTs such as they are, which is basically there's an, an NFT is basically a, a a file or an entry on we'll call it the Ethereum blockchain, even though we know there's others, but for simplicity, and it's got an extra little field for a URL to the digital object. So there's two ways that it's insecure that he taught me. And one of the ways is that somebody can just change the URL or what what's at the destination of the URL. So um, one guy made some art about like just kind of basic Photoshop filters of some uh, well-known crypto Twitter people and sold them. And then he changed all the images after he'd made a bunch of sales to pictures of rugs and saying, I can rug pull <laughs> like this. Now, that's the easy way and it's it's relatively solvable as like the whole nft back end grows to catch up with what the marketplace values it at which is yeah you put multiple redundant urls in there and you'd put some on centralized servers that can be changed and then some on like ipfs and some on all these other blockchain solutions and as long as the hashes of the image files all match with each other then your NFT graphic is roughly persistent, and it's okay for a, a crappy NFT that has no value by the market to like to like die out, and it's okay for like a valuable one to get even more persistency and consistency. So that part of it is sort of like the the fairly easily solvable part, but the other part um, that he was explaining to me and I hadn't really considered is that you have to have a way to verify the signature that's signed by the private key the or sorry the public the, the pub key of the account that created the NFT. So let's say you you made your um your NF, your 99% NFT and your um public key is like 0x111. Anytime somebody buys or sells that they have to ensure they may not they may not check that your public it's the actual nft that 0x111 created they won't check the pub key and it's possible for like an attacker to pay a bunch of gas to mint the exact same nft at the time you 0x111 made it and their 0x 0x222 they they see the image that you're uh, or the URL rather that you're putting on the blockchain and they swap out their pub key for yours. So it's like they conduct a gas race, a man in the middle attack to take your art from you at time of publishing <laughs> and put how their that, signature on it. How would they even know that I'm, do, that I'm, that I'm uploading my NFT though? Exactly. Exactly. Like it's not, it's not a super practical attack and there are ways to replace the pub key or trick it later. Um, okay. by like, uh, let's see if I can, if I can get this right here, um, by uploading, uh, one to another blockchain. And even if yours is first, oh no, wait, maybe that's not it. I, I where, <laughs> see, this is my problem with Bitcoiners is they come <laughs> up with these, they, they, they figure out these ways to attack other, other chains and other projects and this and that. Yeah. And they never focus on fixing their own fucking collapsing house. <laughs> it's like their house is on fire and they're like, don't play with matches. You're an arsonist, blah, blah. And it's like, dude, your house is on fire. Don't yeah. throw stones at other people. Like, it's really easy. Out. It's really easy to, <laughs> it's really easy to point fingers at other stuff. Cause like to be, to be candid, a lot of stuff is not as fully baked as Bitcoin is. And that's fine. Correct. But um, and and where I finally got this Bitcoiner to make 
I, I, I am glad he condescended to make one concession to me that I said that, you know, um, just because something is, isn't perfect doesn't mean it has zero foul, zero value and should be discarded. So at least he, I got him to agree with, uh, with that part of it. And there's, there's massive, massive value in creating a non-fungible token for anything on a blockchain. And I'm not just talking about art, even though that's the easiest sort of proof of concept method that's sort of run away with stuff. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if you've been looking at the, the Uniswap V3 news. It's a whole bunch of like, we've upgraded the um, autom- automated market maker based um i scanned it but i didn't paradigm. get into like yeah tons of details yeah it's, all i um, know is that it tanked my my bags <laughs> as soon as it dropped <laughs> <laughs> yeah sometimes sometimes having skin in the game just means you're, you're oh i took the hit but i don't know why yeah. <laughs> type of yeah. thing but what it well, one of the things that it does is you know how if you add um liquidity to a pool on uniswap version 2 you get uni v2 pool tokens yeah um now that with uni v3 you're going to be able to sort of choose where along the liquidity curve you want to put your li- expose your liquidity rather than to sort of all of it infinitely along the curve you're issued instead of uni v2 tokens that are fungible between each other because they're all in the same equivalent pool you're issued an nft for your specific liquidity range because it's highly unlikely that anybody else is going to issue the same amount of liquidity for the exact same liquidity range as you. So that's an interesting deployment way of doing it. Um, it doesn't, it means that, you know, potentially the, um, your liquidity NFT representations are going to be a little bit harder to sort of DeFi up and use as collateral for other stuff, but maybe they will. And there's going to be a lot more kind of, um, opaqueness to what's going on because a uni v2 token even uni v2 tokens depending on uh, i mean they didn't they don't look any different from each other depending on um which pools and which assets they're deployed into so it's it's really kind of not great ui already for differentiating between them and you have to rely on like websites and software and stuff that can lie to you and now that it's all just nfts and every single liquidity pool is different for you know one asset can have 2000 different nfts all representing a different chunk of liquidity along the curve um it's going to be a little bit more opaque to to use those nfts and deploy them for like more uh leverage into DeFi stuff but it's it's super weird i'm sure it's gonna like i'm not gonna lie i don't understand like half the stuff you just said yeah you know i barely understand it myself like part of me repeating it is like okay can i do i understand this enough to explain it right it's it's wonky and you, you really have to like be involved in doing it often 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 to I mean, get, when you like, say curve you mean the bonding curve um it's it's like a bonding curve but um, because I don't understand, to, I don't understand what a bonding curve is either. Yeah, I, I, it out. took me a long time too, but I'm, I'll try and explain a bonding curve in the most simple way that I can. Okay, hold um, on, really fast, really fast before you do that. Yeah, welcome to Keyword Crypto. <laughs> I'm <laughs> Michael. You. I'm interviewing not so fast, friend of the show. <laughs> Thanks, man. And we're talking <laughs> NFTs, bonding curves, DeFi, Uniswap. Just hang out. Just, just keep listening. You're gonna yeah, hear just, some good stuff. <laughs> we're, we're, we're trying to make sense of it in a way that um, you can actually understand rather than just pretend to understand on Twitter yeah, like exactly. I do all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We'll admit to you that we don't understand stuff. So that's, yeah. that's a good point. <laughs> well, like that's how you do it is you got to you have to like um, kind of fake it and discuss uh, until yeah. you make it. But there's so <laughs> exactly. much of a flow of of interesting difficult stuff to understand that like um it's hard to it's hard to stay on top of like bonding curves are they were some kind of like esoteric mathematical theoretical concept and then suddenly you have smart contract automated market maker liquidity pools and different ways of 
selling something and suddenly bonding curves are like, oh, you have to know what they are if you want to like try and invest in this and make money. And all it is, is an kind of like a one way um, Uniswap market where there's a supply of tokens and they start out at a price. And the every time somebody buys the tokens, depending on how much they paid, that's how much the price increases. So it's just like the curve is the lo- like the line of um, as people buy more and more and make purchases along points of the graph, you can you can graph that curve. And so it can be like a straight line. It can be like usually start out a small slope and then increase in slope. So the later people pay more for the token. Um, you could do it the other way so that the later people pay less for the token, although that doesn't really um, create a whole lot of initial demand. But uh, But there's lots of ways to do a bonding curve. Like you could do a weird old sine wave for the bonding curve where depending on well so hold on what's the point because in my mind i would just say you have a million different liquidity pools and the ones that aren't that liquid you have a higher interest rate on that and the ones that are super liquid you have a lower interest rate on that and you just allow swaps in between them yeah i mean that's what uni v3 is gonna do if i understand you correctly and a bonding curve is just a way to um get distribution of something to people because like to capture a network effect and make it actually usable and give it some value. I think, I think we've, we've come so far away from using Bitcoin's proof of work to distribute stuff to people that like burn some energy or burn something of value that we're trying to with bonding curves. Like we're so far, not that we're past it, but that found that Bitcoin backing foundation is so far below the floor of the skyscraper that we're on when we're making bonding curves, trying to solve the problem of distribution again. Because <laughs> um, nobody really minds anymore, which I shed a tear about all the time. Uh, people people participate by buying now, and that's become a given enough that uh, well, bonding curves oh, just no, a new no, way no, to automate I've, buying. I've been I've been told by Bitcoiners that holding is now participating. Yeah. <laughs> Just the act of holding it is now I am an active participant. And I was like, oh my God, dude. Yeah. When, when, when passiveness becomes like uh, a qualifiable, uh, a noble activity, it's. uh, Because I mean, I don't, to me that, that is like Bitcoiners to a T just sitting in a room being passive. (laughs) (laughs) The very very vocal about the passivity. I I don't want to, I don't want to dunk on Bitcoiners too badly. Um, but it's, it's funny because it's a changing narrative and because we're so overloaded with changing narratives everywhere, it's so easy to forget what it used to be. And like when I first yeah. got involved, you, there would, if you were into, um, get if you were interested in getting into Bitcoin or really any kind of cryptocurrency, you would be encouraged to get your own miner and support the network that way in addition to yeah. like buying it in addition to running a node in addition to like uh learning how it works and then the whole mining thing sort of dropped off and became oh yeah yeah just just leave it to like the industrial professionals that have scaled up because the network's so big now and and that's okay on a certain level but what happens when we get into the habit of dealing with changing narratives saying, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Just leave it to the professionals. Like eventually we're going to get to a point where the professionals hold our Bitcoin for us, completely obliterating the entire point of having it in the first place. Yep. I mean, so I I got into it with somebody on Twitter uh, yesterday, the day of four, because he said, oh my God, uh, Tesla's accepting Bitcoin for their cars. And I was like, great. So what happens if you send them your Bitcoin and they don't give you your Tesla? Well, I'll take them to court. <laughs> Do you not see the irony in your anti-government coin needing government to help you in the situation? It's just yeah. like, what? you're relying on the government. <laughs> That's like <laughs> the, the antithesis of Bitcoin, the antithesis, like the antithesis of S- Satoshi. And like, I was like, dude, that dude is rolling in his grave right now. Just the amount of people who are like, just kind of, and I don't, you know, I joke around about this, but they're like with their Wall Street simps now. 
And it's just like, you guys, what are you yeah. doing? Like you're you're just you keep relying on Wall Street to buy your buy up your bags and all. Uh, I get yeah, into, the, I get into the, the the idea of morality in cryptocurrency and in ethics and what are we buying and does it make you a bad person if you invest in in an oil company? Right. If you if you believe that global warming exists just so you can make some money, like does that make you a bad person? Yeah, so it's like, hard when like incentives mash up against the um like the uh conflicting morality and and i i know like um it's a it's definitely a political thing and i'm sort of like uh i i lean so much on being an anonymous person on the internet and like how can a how can an avatar have politics and all that stuff but like the the real person behind it like i do think about that kind of thing and wonder, you know, where, um, where are the incentives with all this, uh, drive things and like, hopefully they'll drive everything to a healthy place. Um, but very often it looks like, uh, the opposite is happening. Yeah. And if kind of autonomous money networks that are for the people are, are so great, like, uh, does that line up with other stuff that matters, like making sure we have a planet to live on that's you know not uh, getting destroyed by us in the process, and yeah. uh, making sure that uh, everybody has an equal chance at participation and finding prosperity? And I think a lot of it, a lot of what skews it, I think, and I'm I'm sure you'll have like. Uh, probably an uh, a comment that will enlighten me on this but i think that we kind of it we're kind of swimming in the water of capitalism to to borrow from ben hunt from epsilon theory and what that kind of means is that like we're so entrenched within capitalism as a system all encompassing everything we kind of do and all the actions we can possibly take that to to fight capitalism head on is going to be more difficult and be more of an uphill climb than it is to simply work within that universal system like uh not try to like leave the ocean that we're deep within but rather use the ocean and the rules of the ocean in order to subvert it and then eventually be able to move beyond it. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's the old saying is you, you can't, you can't change the system from outside the system. Right. You have to be inside the system to change the system because no matter how much you protest, you, if you're not in the system, you can't actually change the law. Only the people who are working inside the government can actually change the law. Right, right. So if you don't understand how government works, if you don't get elected, if you don't find people who have your same moral and ethical st- viewpoints in life, you're never going to actually change the system. Because what happens is the people inside the system hear the people protesting, placate them, and then just move on like nothing happened because the people who are u- protesting aren't always the ones who are voting. And the people who do vote just call their congressperson and say, "Hey, fucking don't do this again." Or I'm not I'm not a fan of that. And then when enough people who vote call their congressperson, their congressperson usually just votes the way the people tell them to vote. Huh. Because they want to get reelected. Yeah. So it's, it's I mean, it's this idea of like I, I get really upset when people say like the government's the problem. That's like saying the house on fire is the problem. <laughs> the house on fire is not the problem. You playing with matches and catching the house on fire is the problem. <laughs> the fire, the, like the house on fire didn't kill you. You killed yourself by playing with fire and, right. and, and catching the house on fire. I, like, I always equate. So like you, you said something great about, um, you know, uh, the cars driving in, in, the, in a direction or something like that. And, and we want to make sure it goes in the right direction. Well, the only way for that to happen is for us to push the driver out of the driver's seat and get behind the wheel ourselves. Uh huh. Because the car is not an autom- an autonomous thing. The car is just a tool. Exactly. And and I always I so like I always equate Republicans. So um, remember those uh, those movies in the eighties where like. 
the the white family would drive into the inner city and get out of their car and they'd come back and all the wheels were gone and the hubcaps were gone like everything was <laughs> oh, like yeah. I'm sure I've seen that joke on before, center blocks yeah. I, I like I I have like that picture in my mind I say this is republican small government they want a stripped down version of a car that doesn't work and all all like common sense liberals and common sense conservatives they just want like a honda accord fresh off the lot that'll get you from point a to point b <laughs> yeah. easily you know just give me a fucking car that works but republicans like the hardcore republicans like no 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 we need to get rid of the hubcaps we need to only have like four like three lug nuts instead of five because that's cheaper <laughs> and this is like bro like that's it's everything's falling apart because you have systematically but the the reason why they do that is because they own all the companies that sell the lug nuts yeah and they're like yeah, oh yeah. i got some lug nuts oh you're on the side of the road and you got to get to work i have a lug nut for you it's only gonna be five hundred dollars you're like a lug nut <laughs> costs 35 cents you're like you're it's capitalism you have a high need for it right now. Yeah. And so they've learned how to manipulate the system in that way. And it's just unethical. And we, and, and what I've been talking about, and, I, and I'll make this one last point and then yeah. not hog the conversation. <laughs> I've been talking about Jeff Bezos a lot on Twitter because he's a sociopath. <laughs> and I don't, and I, I don't mean that like in a, you know, you're a piece of shit human being. He is a piece of shit human being, but he's an actual sociopath. He has a sickness where he hoards wealth huh. and he doesn't don't and Elon Musk is the same way. Like they don't donate to charity. They don't like, you know, they, they're barely paying any taxes. They hoard as much. They don't pay their employees. They treat their employees like shit. Like he's an actual sociopath. Huh. This isn't like something where I'm just, you know, being hyperbolic when you don't, when, when people, when your employees have to pee into plastic bottles because you won't give them a pee break without losing their jobs, Jeez. you're an actual sociopath. When people are dying on your floor, on your on your warehouse floors because you won't get the medical help. You're an actual sociopath. The thing is, it's not his fault that because he's just born that way. Hmm. It's not his fault that he's a sociopath. It's genetics. So the 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 problem is we have been holding him up as a standard of what to be. So he's like a Pavlovian dog. Every oh. time he does something bad that makes a lot of money, we give him a treat. <laughs> so he keeps doing it over and over. He keeps he keeps re reproducing this 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 reward system because the people around him are making so much money off of him. So it's right. kind of similar to those those famous people who like the, you know they the doctors keep giving him drugs and they're you know and they're and they're and they're uh their entourage keeps on pumping them up even though they're doing all this really bad dangerous stuff to themselves, but the people around them are making so much money they don't want to cut that off. Yeah, yeah, and that's kind of the situation we're in this country. And, and, and I know you're not an American, but like I'm in close America, enough, man, I'm the, I'm the hat enough, being yeah. worn. But, but uh, I mean, you guys have you guys have a big difference in in morality and ethics than we do down here. It's a it's a there are elements that are different, there are elements that are similar, but I think we're still all together in the same kind of capitalist water. As, yeah, definitely, as, definitely. as you know, kind of everybody else. And, and I think, yeah, yeah, but we're drowning in the deep end. You're playing in the shallow. End. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we're making our way though. We're making our way over. Um, <laughs> it's interesting that like, um, you, you hang it on Bezos cause here's, uh, I don't even know if it's a counterpoint, but, or it's definitely, it's certainly not to excuse him, but He's getting rewarded with the um, the status and the vast sums of wealth, and all he's doing is simply operating and making decisions in the positive feedback loop of capitalism that allows winners to consolidate and win more, and have it not have to trickle down to where it would make any um, kind of invisible bottom line social improvement because putting up numbers is what we all pay attention to and social improvements are much, much harder to quantify and much, much harder to pay attention even when they are quantified compared to him being, you know, like a massive rich billionaire. And, and I think like, 
there's a mindset among the wealthy and I'm not sure if I see it play out in just like crypto people who I've known through the years who've made it and done really well for themselves and others. They they want to help and they want to be charitable, but they they want to do it on their own terms. And yeah. rather than having sort of what they perceive as an inefficient machine, uh, do it for them. And so that's where I was sort of... Um, to, to return yeah, but, yeah, to your but that, point that's about the, the cars, sickness. yeah, that's, 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 I, that's I don't a narcissist. Disagree. I mean, I don't disagree. There's a there's a narcissism that comes with being the one in control to make the decisions as as you see fit because you have the resources. It sort of become it, it becomes at odds with the system that we've got to altogether make the decisions for those resources. And then what ends up happening is exactly like you said, is that the the system to, that we all sort of share some ownership in kind of ends up playing, sitting in the back seat, kind of shouting out directions or, hey, maybe uh, think about turning here to the person driving the vehicle, you know? Yeah. You know, and that's the thing is like, so Jeff Bezos is behind the wheel and every time he makes a bad turn, we're like, this is the wrong way. And he hands us and he hands the people in the car $10,000. <laughs> like, okay, don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah, yeah. And he just oh, keeps pay, making all these wrong turns. I'll pay to fix and, it. Yeah. And it's just like, but that's the thing. The rest of us aren't in the car. It's just the, the elected politicians are in the car. Yeah. So yeah. they're making the money off of it. And he's just like, shh. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. Rather than like fighting for big government or small government, if we could have perfectly representative and efficacious government. I think that would yes, solve the just entire nice, problem. Just but nice how do we get Honda it? Accord. That's the just a simple nice Honda Accord. That's, that's all I want. I don't yeah. want a Ferrari. <laughs> nice Honda Accord government. <laughs> Honda Accord government. That's awesome. Yeah. That's that's what we need. <laughs> I was I was I was driving a 90 Honda Accord in a year that started with two zero. So uh <laughs> I can speak firsthand to the reliability of those vehicles. Hey, and they are yeah. solid, solid cars. I catch the and metaphor. Is, is it bad that, that we want uh, a foreign a foreign made car <laughs> to be our representative government? That's another argument. I'm sure some OEM parts were made somewhere around here. Yeah, I mean, but I, that's the thing. Is like I would never say we want a Ford Taurus government. <laughs> which you know that's sad yeah, there's 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 too many there's too many facets to the 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 when you when you start naming a vehicle brand there's too many facets yeah. to the metaphor you, you know what's funny though about cars really fast a little side detour yeah. is people always you know conservatives they're always going to be the ones to say oh you know free market that leads to the best innovation and the best prices and the and and you know the the, the best work and and the reason why america is so great is because of innovation or because of uh you know free market and this and that american cars are like some of the worst the ones that are made in america are some of the worst cars in the world you have you have like the ford uh, fiesta in <laughs> europe that's made in europe those things are amazing Everybody in Europe drives Ford Fiestas and Ford Focuses. They're huge. Yeah. One of the biggest cars in here in America, they're absolute garbage. And people are like, well, you know, I, I don't know, you know, just whatever. It's just, it's, you know, they're, they're getting priced out by the, by the Japanese and the, and the Koreans and this and that. And, but, and they, you know, they have, they have to cut corners. And, and I think to myself, okay, so maybe we should have socialism for the car industry then. Huh. Because we have a free market for cars, but we don't have a free market for for full size trucks. America is not allowed to um, import full size vehicles like full size Mitsubishi trucks or huh. you know full size unless they're made in America, like so haulers we, we, and stuff, right? For for shipping and stuff. No, no, I mean like like the, the Ford F one fifty. Okay, okay. So the only reason we have the Toyota Tundra is because they built a plant in Texas, and now they make the the, the, the Toyota Tundra in america oh fascinating but everything else is just ford chevy dodge ram you know and then and then the toyota tundra and full-size trucks are known as one of the most reliable vehicles on the face of the planet and there's no competition and the prices are dirt cheap for a full-size truck and those things last for like 20 years so it puts the whole idea of a free market producing the best just it stops it in its tracks 
Yeah, because yeah. you have well, you have the free market for cars and they're garbage, and you have the free market for truck, and you don't have the free market for trucks, and they're the the best in, things in the world. Yeah, yeah. So, There's some funny analogs that you can that you can derive out of that because you know cars cars are one thing, but uh, you know you, let's say like you have like a free market for for labor, and then you have like a dictatorial market for labor, or you have like a free market for like, uh, I guess, human quality of life. And then you have like a dictatorial market for human quality of life. Like definitely. And the whole, the whole thing for the auto industry, I don't know a whole lot um, about it. Um, Certainly not quite enough to be able to add what you said to, to anything that you said, but I'm wondering if like, there's um like the like free market gets kicked into hyperdrive too often and what you have is things just like uh being pushed via incentives to make money for their own sake and the best analogy i can have for that is not necessarily the auto industry though it's probably happened the same way is like the the kodak problem where like kodak is a name i believe it was kodak began in life as an american company and then it straight up uh got um, the, the brand name got stripped off the failed business for whatever reason and began getting sold off to anybody who wanted to use it every couple of years. And I'm wondering if like the U S auto industry, as far as the car portion you described just got like, um, you know, when, when Detroit kind of underwent its, uh, uh it, it's kind of, uh, decline i guess is the only way i can really say it is yeah. when all, all those brands got sort of split up and sold off and stripped from the actual value making or value creating process that they represented and got sold to other stuff and it was um it was it, the brand name became the lipstick on the pig that was left over type thing you know i'm not sure if i'm making yeah i mean i would i would totally i would totally think that if you didn't have ford trucks also yeah which is the complete opposite thing happening. Like you don't have Ford trucks being, you know, shipped off or, you know, built in China and then shipped back here. Right. You don't have, for, so for whatever reason, our, our, the inability of importing foreign made full size trucks has created a market that keeps prices low and yeah. keeps quality high. The, the the absolute antithesis of what free marketeers claim the free market does. Yeah. I wonder how many other examples there are like that out there because I'm, I'm sure that's not the only one. I, I, yeah. It's the only one I've, I'm, I'm aware of in those terms because the prices are so high and, and car prices have, have you know drastically changed for high-end ones, but yeah. full-size trucks have... I feel like I've relatively stayed the same and, and, and just gone up with inflation, you know, like 2% a year or whatever it is. Um, nothing crazy because, you know, cars now are, are astronomical. And then I see like, oh, brand new full-size truck, $7,000 cash back down to like 19000 And it's just like, <laughs> holy shit, man. <laughs> like, wow, that's crazy how cheap they are. So and, um, uh, I, I'm sure... Uh, You'd like to pick my brain more on keyword auto as my, an automobile expert. But <laughs> <laughs> that about I mean, the, 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 the problem about, when we start talking about politics and my brain just starts going in a million different directions. But let's go. Let's bring it back to your hack because I know oh, God, I know you're yeah. working on I, I know you're working on an article and actually some people in a couple of groups I'm just like oh where's the article we're waiting for the article yeah I'm so too you, I'm very slow at this type of thing and it's 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 partly because um i had some help um looking into it like investigating with it and so there's stuff uh for a little while like i didn't want to i didn't want to say anything publicly just because i hadn't sort of um plugged all the potential security leaks in my own setup um and and you know it was it was almost completely attributable to me being careless in certain ways that I should know better about and um, where my own relatively high security stuff saved me is that I keep things compartmentalized. So my 
MetaMask, Ethereum, ape into whatever deep fi- DeFi stuff I I have occasion to do, um, that was completely compromised. And the only saving grace was that my other stuff was separate from it, and that um, you know I didn't I didn't know it right at the time of the hack, and I wasn't um, sure enough until you know weeks later once I had time to do a security audit. But um, that other stuff was uh, safe, so okay. I took the hit where I had planned to you know take the take the hit really and even you know hurt a lot i lost a a a chunk of my net worth on that but it wasn't everything and um i it was my it was me betraying my own practices as sort of uh not really conditioned but as DeFi warrants you to be like extremely liquid and make connections with shady websites because you gotta to really make the big money you gotta be like within the first 10 minutes or 10 transactions is sort of like the joke rule like if you're yeah um there there are people out there that make their um make their big money uh sort of it's analogous to spec mining being the first person to mine on a new blockchain which i love to do back in the day when it was still viable. But the equivalent now is scanning the Ethereum blockchain or whatever blockchain for new farms before the front end of the website to interact with the farming contract is published. And you just interact with the back end of the farm right oh, from God. Etherscan. And if you do that, um, before most people using are using the front end of the website, you can get like all the early farming rewards to yourself. Uh, oh, that's what a lot of people do. Well, not many people do, but, uh, kind of more and more it's an, it's an, it's an edge that, uh, people with a little bit more knowledge of what's going on is discovered. And that's the closest thing to spec mining, um, that, uh, that I can really see out there. And I've just, because I was so late to DeFi, um, I, I kind of, I, I'm sadly not on top of that. Uh, but at least now I know and understand kind of how it works. And that's kind of one of many many edges in DeFi that, that you can do. But I learned to uh, interact with a contract directly from Etherscan and um, starting to become a little more literate as to what uh, what all that means. And one of the other, going circling back to the hack, one of the, um, I guess the extra extraneous pieces of work into figuring out what I had done to compromise my assets when you're messing around with smart contract platforms usually what you do is you connect to the contract by way of a website and a little pop-up will happen in metamask and it says connect this address with this website question mark and you choose the address that you want to connect and you can choose all your Ethereum addresses that you have available if you want, and then you connect and then you're connected and then you can, you know, buy or do whatever you want. But what happens is if you ever want to disconnect from a contract, it's a gas costing transaction. Like it's not free. So if you connect to all this stuff willy nilly and you don't check or know how to check the contract to see what you're authorizing, there may be some shady stuff that you've allowed this contract to do. And this isn't of itself going to necessarily be too bad. I mean, don't um, connect with a weird website that says, allow this website to spend all your Ethereum or spend all the stable coins in your wallet. You're probably going to look at it and click no. Yeah. But if you're connected to all these different um websites, there's a good chance that one of them is going to have a bunch of scripts served in the browser to real to see like to profile you very extensively. Any extension in your browser can see all the tabs you have open and register the URLs. And any uh they can see all your Ethereum addresses if MetaMask is open. It's as though it's open on every single browser tab that you have. So if you've surfed to one shady site with like a hundred tabs open, 
20 of them MetaMask DeFi tabs that aren't logged out, um, a profile has been built. And if you surf to the wrong tab and you get thrown a fake MetaMask login prompt from a site, which can happen, and you enter your password thinking, oh, I guess I just must have been auto logged out by something. That's where they got you. And I think that might be what happened to me. Not 100% sure. But given the uh, work I've done to look over all my stuff, I don't think something else on my machine was compromised. I think that's how they got me. Um, Shit, that's scary. Because I can't tell. A few times I've come to my computer and I've been logged out of MetaMask. And I can't tell if it was just because MetaMask was updated. Right. And when it updates it auto log it logs you out and i'm still trying to write up a best practice for what you do when that happens um okay the the problem is that leaving metamask open and interacting with web3 as you would any other website by just you know input the url go to the website metamask pops up you can do transactions here you can do whatever you want that convenience is awesome. That convenience has driven the explosion of DeFi and Ethereum Web3 based anything. But the problem is that because our browsing habits are encouraged to be extremely sloppy by default and browsers are incredibly insecure, like <laughs> I knew they were bad, but because everybody does it, I figured, ah, you know, I'm. Um, I'm relatively secure in my other practices. The way to browse securely within, like as a Web3 user with money in a browser extension that every single website you visit can see, uh, the habits that you need to do in order to to browse safely can kind of change. Um, the right way to do it, and this is probably going to be some of the um the meat and potatoes of uh, of the article that that's uh that's in the works is that ideally you have a new browser profile for each web3 contract that you want to interact with with a new metamask installation on a separate set of ethereum seed words so that if that particular site turns out to be um, shall we say malfeasant, an attacker, it can't profile all the other Ethereum related services that you have, uh, all the other DeFi stuff that you may have open because it's sitting in its own separate browser profile. Now that is extremely onerous if we consider that if you want to interact with 20 different DeFi, DeFi profiles, you have to have 20 different Ethereum seeds with 20 different wallets and you have to be logging in and out with 20 different passwords all the time just to interact with, with this stuff. Like it, uh, it definitely reduces the convenience factor. And one way to be able to, would you even be able to log out? Wouldn't you have to like delete MetaMask from your browser, reinstall it with the new seed? Because um, just logging out of your path, logging out. I mean, I guess maybe you could log out. I'm tr- Hold on, let me check MetaMask right now if I can actually log out. Yeah, yeah, you can lock your MetaMask and then you have to enter the password again to... Uh, and then another yeah, but big isn't, reason isn't how, that the same seed though? Yeah, it's the same seed. But if you make a new browser profile, um, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not as familiar with an Apple environment, so I don't know how easy it is, but I know with... Um, with uh, Brave and Chrome, you can make as many browser profiles as you have uh, sort of avatar icons to give them. And um, you can use a different MetaMask seed for each one. Uh, That's a way to compartmentalize even further and keep yourself from being profiled from the browser level. Like if somehow some kind of shady software gets onto your machine from like um, an attachment that you opened inadvertently, um, then you're at even more risk. So fortunately, my protections against that were pretty strong and I'm, I'm quite certain that that didn't happen to me. Uh, another thing that I wasn't doing though, which was the, the biggest security hole, is that I was only securing my MetaMask with a password, like with one FA. And you should really be using a second factor of a hardware wallet like a Trezor or a Ledger 
for each interaction with MetaMask that you do. And as far as I can tell, you can have multiple different Ethereum wallets on one hardware device, one for each browser profile that you're logging into so that you can um, use one hardware. You don't have to carry like a dongle of 20 hardware wallets just to do yeah. DeFi stuff in multiple browsers and stuff, right? Yeah. But they do have a limit. And so um, that's uh, that's something that makes it way, way, way less convenient. Um, there are ways, there, there, there are sort of better solutions. I, I, here's what I'm going to, I think, end up advising is for, for small amounts that you want to move funds quickly, you can have a certain smaller percentage of your money in a one FA thing. As long as you know that you keep a minimum of dry powder in that account, you only use it for your most degenerate, um, fun having gambling yeah and if you if you make any money or get any assets don't let it connect to too many different sites before you move everything of value off of it at a time of cheap gas to sort of clean up after yourself and then when you have time wipe the wallet generate a brand new seed for it and start again so that you don't build over time a big profile that makes you become sort of a target for a hack. And uh, there's... Really there's fast, that, doesn't that, yeah. I mean, doesn't that kind of essentially delete that wallet address? Yeah, so if somebody like were airdrops to... Airdrops or, I mean, all these different things that that become associated down the road. People are like, oh my God, I, I found, I didn't realize I had this extra wallet and now I have five, you know, 500 or 800 extra uni that I didn't know I had before. Yeah, now that's yeah. worth $30,000. That's the so challenge. Like, there could be airdrops to these old addresses um, that you might not n- know about. Um, the best thing that you can do about that is just kind of keep the backup keys. And if you know there's going to be an airdrop or if you want to go, uh, go and check your old wallets you can um, boot up an old like crappy Chromebook. Chromebooks are awesome because they're hardened devices that don't run a whole lot of extra stuff. If you have a fresh Chromebook, you can sweep, you can, you know, enter the seed words of the MetaMask that you want to check for airdrops into that. And then if you have any airdrop tokens, like, uh, and send a little bit of, gas ETH money to there and dump them and send it or, you know, interact with the wallet like temporarily, but then delete that browser profile and you don't have to uh, deal with it again. Then you can go through all your old stuff. It's onerous. It's not like looking at your wallet and seeing, oh man, I got $700 worth of airdrops. Awesome. Uh, Very often, like there will be crappy airdrops that just want to kind of ping you that you have something in your wallet in order to maybe make you do something that's less secure than you would normally uh do you know and there's all sorts of ways to to bait you into um revealing something that you don't want to i in fact i just uh saw something yesterday of a guy who was this is i guess now third hand information but um someone sent their seed words to uh developer they thought in telegram who was helping them get back coins or tokens that were sent to an address on the wrong blockchain and there's so much of this happening because if you send let's say like i don't know binance chain tokens to an ethereum address there they could in some circumstances be recoverable and if you misfire and you're used to dealing with all these like centralized services or whatever, you don't know for sure whether there's someone at the other end that can correct your mistake and get your assets back. Yeah. And so what I tell people is if you misfire something, it's gone. Consider it gone. Like, whoops, because that's how it used to be. I've misfired yeah. bit- Bitcoin, like an embarrassing amount of Bitcoin. And I feel stupid about it. Sometimes somebody sent me some back. But uh, it wasn't all of it. (laughs) (laughs) It wasn't all of it. 
And um, it was nice of them to send me back something because at that point I gave it away. But we've become accustomed to thinking like, oh, well, I can get my money back because it's so uh, it, it's, it feels so comfortable and common um, to be able to to reach out and <laughs> get my whoopsie back. Um, yeah, it, it's it's the type of thing where you've um, you if you're acting in haste you're almost certainly going to make a mistake. And there are things you can give people like an Ethereum address that has never been used before. And there are things that you should never give people like an old Ethereum address that you've used for a lot of stuff. Um, uh, definitely like your seed words or your passwords. Never let anybody do something with your wallet for you. It's got to be you. Even if you don't know how to do it, don't let them do it. Yeah. Ask them like, where can I learn how to do this myself? And if they are, if they say, Oh, just let me, just give me your seed words. I'll do it for you really quickly. That's, uh, that's not what you should be doing. <laughs> well, I mean, you should, I mean, all, like to people listening, never, ever, ever give your seed words to anybody. Never, ever. Flat out. Just yeah. flat out. I mean, there's just, that's just, yeah. That's so what about something like, like rot key? Have you used that? Uh, no, what? I'm not familiar with that. So it's it's like a um, it's like a decentralized version of coin tracking. I think I guess. Oh, neat. Okay, me. Okay, and it's a portfolio tracker, right? It's not so. Yeah, so it's a portfolio tracker, but it's also like an ex- so you can like put in your APIs for whatever exchanges you you, you use. You can put in your Ethereum addresses. So potentially you could just wipe, you could wipe, um, you could d- not delete, but like wipe uh, a MetaMask account, a MetaMask account after installing all those addresses into Rocky and then go on to a new one. And Rocky would tell you essentially if those old addresses ever got an airdrop on them. Ah, right. It's a, it's a watchdog for airdrops and stuff. Yeah. So like that could, t- that could, pot- I mean, it's not, that's not its goal, but I could see how like that could potentially work. Yeah. Um, that could be like a, a little, a little, I mean, cause even coin tracking too, if you moved on to a new Ethereum address and you moved everything to that new Ethereum address and you kept the old Ethereum address on coin tracking, it would tell you if, if new stuff just random, randomly appeared. Yeah. Or new stuff of any value or anything like that. That's the, yeah. that's the other challenge of Ethereum based stuff because it's account based. Uh, everything's so much more connected. Like there's no, um, protocol native coin join like there is with utxo based cryptocurrencies like like bitcoin and we're not even going to talk about like monero style privacy they're just uh coin joins a native um transaction type to bitcoin and ethereum has no analog to that um so you have to use like a smart contract like tornado tornado is the most popular uh one and tornadoing your cryptocurrency is expensive and because accounts are so easily and simply visible on Ethereum, um, there will eventually be, if there aren't already, uh, services that will say, well, you have to account for this tornadoed cash, this tornadoed Ethereum, if you're using it with uh, with us or we we can't necessarily accept it. And there's been, um, yeah. you know, BlockFi, the Bitcoin Just bank, came for lack out. of a yeah. better word. Yeah, there, um, there was a tweet circulating around where they don't take mixed bitcoins they don't yeah. take stuff from my like if i tried to deposit stuff from my samurai wallet where i do like a privacy transaction every single time as a matter of good habits they would seize my funds yeah and you know this is not crazy the we wanted it. i know i mean which so i was talking with somebody with nano and they said this is this is one of the benefits of nano is that um there is no uh, d- uh, uh, identifier to an individual nano uh, coin. So yeah. once it goes into the pool, you can't tell one from the other. It has no history. It has no nothing. So if you so if you send me a bunch of nano that was you know whatever, there's no way. And I and I put it into another wallet. There's no way to know it was yours 
before yeah. I was mine. The pool of nano, the way it's designed with the DAG is such that like it's it's nearly impossible. Like the, they're very fungible. Nano is very fungible. The difficulty yeah. with nano, the challenge that they're having lately, and this was kind of always looming, um, is that zero fee networks ha- are susceptible to spam. And yeah, I just dropped an interview with Patrick Luberis and we, we talked about that. Oh, for, awesome. Awesome. You know, so if you have a chance to, if you have a chance to listen to that, yeah, um, I want to, I, I have a, I have a duty impression. to as like <laughs> <laughs> the discoverer of nano <laughs> because he's a smart, cause he's a smart guy and he's like, kind of like the new de facto tech person. Oh, cool. When, when they can't get somebody from nano foundation is they reach out to Patrick. So I've, 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 Picked his brain twice on two different episodes now. Oh, awesome! So wait, I'll a minute. you you found Ryblox? No, it's the it's the running joke. I was the first oh, okay. post on Bitcoin Talk. <laughs> oh wow! Oh, so, so I get way nice. more credit than I'm due. Honestly, right? Well, but, I mean, uh, that's it's like I so so you're the reason why every, everybody hates uh, <laughs> hates <laughs> Nano in the Bitcoin community. <laughs> no, that's everybody that came after that. that are you aware of like the whole like uh Rybo- Ryblox like uh captcha mining enterprise that was uh in its yeah, early days? I thought, I thought that was great. It was pretty nuts. We we had we had um legends like Bitcoin Dad. He employed a ton of people on Fiverr to do his clicking for him, paid them out no like way. a fair por- proportion and there was like a massive overnight industry boom in other parts of the world of people farming nano just like you would That's farm great. in-game currencies <laughs> i mean wasn't it like it was a fraction of a fraction of a penny when it was when they were doing that right yeah it wasn't big it wasn't big so i mean like i think i think that's the reason why they did it they're like hey cool you want to spend days and weeks doing captchas totally cool here's your four dollars <laughs> you know <laughs> it's just like and, and if it takes off, great. And if it doesn't, great. You know, no big deal. Like, yeah, I, I yeah. love that idea of, I just wish they did it like over the course of two years or something like that. You know? Yeah, and, it was for a while. It wasn't It wasn't anywhere near two years, but it was for several months as far as I recall. And I, I, if only, and this might turn it back a little bit to the political, but, you know, the, uh, the people, the, 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 the capitalists who were able to employ all these people in a temporary position farming nano were the ones able to hang on to the profits and reap the rewards of the what 2000 x that it did from there while the other feudalism baby feudalism it's just a (laughs) modern day 2017 crypto feudalism (laughs) it's it's absolutely true it's you know reaping the rewards off of off of other people's work i mean that's like i mean in this situation hindsight is 2020 i mean it could have been that the um that nano fell on its face for whatever reason and yeah. um, the the people working in the feudal system got were the only ones that got the reward and the uh the enterprising capitalist got nothing and then yeah. uh, then we could look back and say well that was fair but uh no the uh they got the gains they got the gains i mean it, but that's just thin. it's just like what I get frustrated with is like, hey, why are you letting this person pay you to do something that you could do on your own and collect the reward yourself? That's true. And who's to say that like he uh, he didn't also, or uh, you know, I I capture mind a few nano, um, but there's no there's no way to do it like scale. I guess if uh, if someone gets three hundred people off of Fiverr click farming for them, um, yeah. You know, that's, uh, and every single thing in cryptocurrency generation, uh, that isn't buying in, but using some form of proof of work. And even if the work is captures, I mean, the scale race is what it's all about. I mean, uh, Laszlo, the guy who bought Bitcoin pizzas had all that extra Bitcoin to risk on buying pizzas because, he was, I believe, the second GPU miner of Bitcoin. Oh my God. When everybody else was just slapping it with CPUs. So he had a surplus and he was thinking like, oh man, if I get too many of these, um, it's not going to be healthy for the distribution of the network. So I better spread it around. Hey, want to um, send me some pizza and I'll uh, send you some Bitcoins? So what, what I tell people, and I said it on Twitter a uh, 
like last week or something like that is if you're not tipping that guy, if you're not, tip, if you're not tipping two pizza, uh, Bitcoin guy once a year on, on Bitcoin pizza day, and you're a Bitcoin millionaire, you're kind of an asshole because <laughs> he like Bitcoin is where it is because of his actions yeah. and his meme and his joke. And, 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 you know, that, that like, you can point to one thing that's that, that shows that this is somebody who understood the only way for the network to succeed and was willing to sacrifice like hundreds of millions of dollars to do it. Yeah. And if you're not sending this guy a hundred bucks on Bitcoin pizza day and you have a million dollars worth of Bitcoin, you're kind of a piece of shit. Honestly though, because man, you just don't respect like your elders who came before you. <laughs> I get it. I get it. But the last thing that guy wants is to have his addresses known because I guarantee you he, he spent, less than half, probably far less than half of his Bitcoins on that. Oh, pizza. no, but he, I'm saying like, <laughs> you know, somebody could create a donation site to him on Coinbase or something like that and just oh, send yeah. him, you know, s- send him the keys to it immediately and be like, there you go, bud. Yeah. And do that once a year. Just just, just create a new Coinbase do- donation account once a year and send him the seeds every year. Yeah. And it's yeah. Just like, Honestly, I think some of these early Bitcoiners, the best thing you can do is like almost forget that they exist because they want to drop off the face of the earth. One thing about being your own bank, man, um, you got to be, Oof. especially if you're like a, two, a 2010 Bitcoiner, is $5 wrenches are, are scary. Um, yeah. The, I, I read a, a, a thread recently about, um, I think he's actually a fellow Canadian because he worked for a Canadian Bitcoin company who was beaten until he gave up his private keys and beaten until he gave up his, his decoy wallets. And... Um, you know, God. personal safety aside, like there may be a lot that some people might be willing to take, but you know, um, we also have loved ones who are equally susceptible. Yeah. And, uh, man, you know, like that type of thing. There's another reason why, um, we got to build out stuff like, uh, secure and hard to access multi-signature um, yep. stuff where like, have you been following even... the, the very capital stuff? Yeah. So if, if you're, if you're listening, you don't know what we're talking about. The very capital is, um, very capital is like, like what, like a liquidity pool type thing platform in essence, but they have like $38 billion staked on their site right now. And all the devs are teenagers or early twenties. <laughs> And one of them apparently is 15 years old and had the keys to like the bank essentially. Yeah. And, and, uh, a, a, a crypto personality was like, Hey, so, you know, who has the keys, blah, blah. And, and, and he was just asking basic questions. He's like, you know, people are, I, I don't know if I want to invest in this. I want to do some due diligence. Who has yeah. the keys? And they're like, you know, like, don't worry about it. And he's like, oh, well, do you have the keys? Like, Yeah. Like, well, uh, how old are you? Don't worry about it. Like, do, do, you know, what are you stupid? You know, like, 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 a, like, like, what a fifteen-year-old would do. How a fifteen-year-old would respond. And the, and the guy and Chris is like, holy shit, this fifteen-year-old has keys to thirty-eight, you know, million a billion million dollars. And like, I don't want to invest my money in that. And so he gets shit on for being like an ageist and all oh, no. this stuff. Oh, and, no. and it's like, okay, but and and people are like, well, you know, you shouldn't blah blah and blah blah. And so whole fights and my response is maybe instead of doing the same old bullshit farming crap that we're doing we should be focusing on solving this problem of security because isn't that the whole fucking point of cryptocurrency is to try to solve this problem of 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 secured of securing our money and cryptocurrency has not solved that problem yet no well it's not just a cryptocurrency problem although cryptocurrency puts a finer point on it for sure I mean, um, you've, uh, my, my whole way of thinking about it is it's really good to be, uh, pseudonymous or anonymous to a degree. Yeah. Um, that is a very cheap solution that you can use that pays off, um, in, in large proportion. And another way you can do it is by kind of being, um, yeah, definitely, Unless you're the type of person who can live that that life, 
it's a good idea to not flex about stuff publicly. Exactly. It's a good idea to not be lead the Instagram life. Uh, first of all, because it, it can make you even more of a target than you might've already been. Second of all, be, uh, because it can leak a bunch of metadata that you might not want out there. Like if you're, um, I, I hate to use him as an example cause he's a great dude, but, um, this, the, it's the most recent vehicle purchase of an Aston Martin comes to mind. Like that's, um, that's the type of thing where like, there aren't too many people buying secure, like, like massive vehicles of that value all the time. Like that's a way for somebody, if they're looking for you to find you and it may not be the person that you want to find you. Yeah. And it's all, it's, it's just really good to, um, I'll, uh, it's, it's good to, to seed disinformation as well. Um, you know, uh, I am, I guess, fairly well known for being like an honest, truthful dude, but you can bet that I will lie about my identity or tell the truth, uh, see disinformation <laughs> about out there because first of all, I'm an, I'm pseudonymous, so it shouldn't really matter. And yeah. second of all, like I'm doing it not just for this, my own safety, but for the safety of my loved ones and stuff. So like, yeah. There are certain things and like, no, not, not like private conversation or anything like that. But if I'm talking about something where personal context comes up, you know, publicly on Twitter or anything, damn right. I'll lie. I'm going to lie to you. Yeah. It's protecting no myself. Business. It's protecting my family. Right. It's just good yeah. OPSEC practice. And that's something that I've always wanted to like set an example of from the very beginning. And I've been a bad example of it because I've been compromised a uh, total of four times in my crypto career. <laughs> <laughs> One time I lost like 80% of everything I had. Holy shit, man. Yeah, man. I was so dumb. I was so dumb. It was on my second last day of a vacation too. And I just uh, remoted into my home computer and saw my wallets that were staking that had been drained. Oh. I downloaded a Trojan and it emptied everything out. Yeah, so I can't wait for you to release that because <laughs> I I feel like I'm so I use unwrecked.net. Are you familiar with that? I don't think so. Um it allows it claims to allow the uh the ability to revoke um permissions. Oh, oh, okay. There's a few sites that do that. And I think on the day of my MetaMask compromise, I was using it but I realized what a gas intensive long battle it would be for me to revoke all possible oh. permissions from all possible. Yeah, I mean, that's like thousands of dollars. Yeah. So I do, I do it with BSC because it's like 10 cents per yep. revoke. Yep. And so, and that, and that, I feel like that's the only one I, I do. I, I, I degen a little bit is on BSC, but like, so, but even then it's just like, I've kind of slowly moved away from that and just, at this point, as as crappy as it is, I just kind of stick to Uniswap and just kind of wait for gas fees to be low and <laughs> suck it up and and try to make more um, competent and educated plays now versus <laughs> just because it's like I kind of have to it up rather than loosening it up. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's a that's a just generally a good thing. And you know when um, when gas is cheap like it is on bsc and we all know why um because it's hella centralized <laughs> um yeah it, uh, it's a hella centralized version of a decentralized smart contract evm network but um you can it, it would be awesome to auto revoke contracts like that it's just um allowing something just requires a signature and disallowing something requires a revocation that has to be written on the on chain and so it requires gas and i can't wait for a time when um you know eth fees come down it's going to be one of a whole bunch of different ways um like you got your your proof of stake you got your eip 1559 that's gonna um start burning fees away from the miners who are very angry about it and then you got like yeah. this interoperability with all these other blockchains out there that run similar evms and you'll be able to eventually um just spend gas on whatever chain is cheapest right at the 
right at the moment. So uh, I don't think we'll have this this problem for long. I hope we don't have to undergo like a brutal multi-year bear market first before it happens because uh, I don't want to go through that again. I know. But, uh, oh my God. but ideally, like the future of finance um, is uh, that we don't have a, a, a very rocky path from now till then to get there, you know? Well, I mean, so, and what's your take? So, I mean, as somebody who's, who's been in the, mar- in the space longer than I have, what's your take on the idea of optimistic rollups and Arbitrum? Do you think DeFi is going to move over there or do you think it's going to stay on main chain and still have exorbitant fees? Because like once, as more and more people get into DeFi, if people don't want to move the DeFi over to a second layer because they want instant, they want it to be on the on the blockchain instantaneously because they're mm-hmm. using large sums of money, isn't that just going to keep the same issue of like driving up fees on layer one and then only rich people can use it and then only rich people can participate in DeFi? <laughs> I hope that's not what happens. I mean, I guess the right way to think about it is that Ethereum has the big network effect right now. And that's why gas is getting so high and it's all getting congested. And, you know, the long ago, this is why like altcoins were developed like, oh, well, you know, if Bitcoin becomes too expensive or too crazy, uh, if I can't mine Bitcoin, well, I'll mine this and exchange it for Bitcoin. Or if I, if Bitcoin fees get too high and I can't uh, run my NFT battle beast game on Bitcoin, I'll run it on this network or I'll just fail. Uh, there's, a, there's a way of sort of uh, bleeding out laterally to all sorts of different networks um, be, by virtue of free open source software, letting you clone a whole new um space within which to work and because of evms and smart contracts being sort of the place where all that type of stuff is being built the most um because they're all evm based they're all they all share similar enough dna that they're not distant islands like different utxo blockchains used to be um, yeah. they're much easier to sort of interoperate with each other and build and weave into each other. So I think there are so many incoming ways for it to happen that what you'll see is just, uh, you, you, you kind of watch where people are naturally incentivized to chase their yield. So people, as soon as gas fees got like ridiculously expensive, that's why BSC has been able to gain so much ground because, you know, when yeah. Shang Peng Zhao runs all the nodes or controls all the people who runs all, run all the nodes, he can yeah. you know, keep fees super low and there's uptake because people don't care what flavor the money uh, is that they make. They just want to be making money without it costing them an arm and a leg. They, they don't yeah. want to have that extra fee risk to, uh, to try to, you know, trying to chase yield. And so that will like BSC is where it's at for the time being. And then as other stuff, um, interoperates and I, I I feel like there's a hammer coming down fairly soon. Um, I've been saying it for years, so I've been wrong for years because I kept thinking that it was (laughs) imminent, but there's, there's going to be a regulation crackdown on all this stuff as like, governments get good at reading public blockchains and figuring out um, who did what and tying it to your real world identity and sort of uh, making sure that they get their tax share. Um, Yeah. And you know, that is it, is it wrong? Like, I guess not really in the system that we subscribe to by virtue of our citizenship in places. Um, Is it wrong to sort of work backwards Possibly because uh, the rules and guidance were not in place for very many years when people were asking for it. So it's kind of hard to to retroactively make it like that. And what's definitely wrong, though, is the um, 
the affordances given to elites that are not going to be given to uh, regular citizens such as you or I. And the example that I love to use is Michael Saylor, who is able to use his corporation to borrow at 0% interest, issuing a bunch of convertible notes that he then uses to buy spot Bitcoin with, and then adds that to his portfolio. And now he has all this capital against which he can write convertible notes again. And eventually, if he really wanted to, like, who's going to stop him when he defaults on all this debt and exactly. has all the Bitcoin to borrow more money to hire lawyers to, you know, <laughs> argue yeah. that he didn't really default or like he's not going to pay. And this is what this is. You know. Or just be forced to sell all his Bitcoin. I mean, he's already collapsed one comp- company 10 years ago. Yeah, so that's like, true. He's, that's he's, true. He's probably going to collapse this company too. But here's the and, thing. And he, and he collapsed to doing something just as easy, you know, equally shady. <laughs> He's just a shady person. And so like that's a th- I think that's what I get frustrated about with with the cryptocurrency people is they claim to get into this this system because they don't like the current system. Yet they're they're rewarding people with emotional um emotional rewards of like likes and follows and this and that when they do the shady shit that they got into crypto in the in the first place for that they didn't yeah. like. Now I'm I'm all like, about like you know human complexity and absolution and like you can do some shitty things at the same time as doing some really good things. I don't like the deification of Michael Saylor at all. I totally agree with you there. I don't think yeah. uh, he should be on the pedestal that he is. And uh, but but where I think it's most important to note is that he never has to sell his Bitcoin for any reason, and he knows it. Because he's in, uh, is controlling a sovereign amount of hard money assets, and he can borrow money for free anytime he wants. Um, there are decentralized protocols that, if somehow legal venues do not let him or get fed up with him because he's going to risk defaulting, he can mix up a bunch of his Bitcoin and uh, do it on a decentralized service. You know, bore, uh, th- these are only going to get more and more voluminous. And he can um, pay, you know, fines, fees, penalties, taxes, whatever out of that and not have to give up any of his actual Bitcoin. So that's the one thing where one place where I think he might stand his ground and where, you know, definitely Elon Musk is probably doing it too. They know that the Bitcoin network is enough of a going concern on the Lindy curve now, which is basically a meme at this point of how much something is going to um, uh, have a bright future based on the bright fu- bright past it's already had. Um, they know that Bitcoin is the place to grab as much possible land now because it's going to be like the sort of, uh, it. Uh, it's just future rent seeking, right? Like early Bitcoiners were lucky to get in relatively cheap and be able to sort of do the free rider effect from then till now. And now it's large, a large enough system that people like Michael Saylor and Elon Musk with massive amounts of disproportionate wealth to put in a parking lot can park it and then free ride on the economy of that for the rest of the time, which I'm not saying is right, but my only and best sort of uh, native solution to all of that is just let free open source software proliferate and let people make altcoins and let people make tokens and let them live or die by their own network effects. Because no matter how big or efficacious or lean and small a government gets, there's no way they can squash them all. Yeah. But the problem is that by letting Michael Saylor and Elon Musk do this, is the government is now in a situation in Wall Street too, in a situation where they can't allow them to fold because yep. they know they can't collect on any of it. That's right. They so have now to they have it. to artifici- artificially prop them up, and not, which is essentially what they've done with with essentially what the United States and Canada has done with the housing market. Yeah, it's because everyone's wealth is tied up in their homes. They can't allow the housing market to collapse without wiping out, you know, the vast majority of the wealth of, of our two countries. That's uh that's a good point. And it's almost just 
one more inadvertent, we had no other choice step along a path that's been trodden for a while. It was just, um, it's the sad reality of kind of like the corporate system being naturally more profitable than a social system that su- is is meant to like support people and the profitability compounded over time giving rise to optionality and that optionality allows for influencing the sort of here for the people social system in to a point whereby small iterations it becomes sort of here for the corporate people <laughs> but, it, but it's also but it's also like you said earlier about like the rich being treated differently than the poor oh yeah yeah like with coinbase wash trading they essentially stole hundreds of millions of dollars from people i didn't now, know anything that over oh man well yeah like with with the wash trading of litecoin you artificially increase the price of of Litecoin, so people were buying into Litecoin all the way up to three fifty, and then he sold one hundred percent of his Litecoin, taking the price. So everybody who bought from him at that artificial at that artificial price that he inflated himself by wash trading, that they've admitted to, they pretty much and now they pretty much lost you know ninety percent of their life savings. Oh man, and have to and have to hope that Litecoin will go back up. That was when, which is never going to do because it's not being wash traded anymore. Was that Charlie Lee doing that? Is that when he sold? No, that can't have been him. That's employee A. Oh, employee A. Yeah, it's Charlie. It's Charlie Charlie. Lee. Oh, oh, I'm assuming it's Charlie Lee. Oh, so he so anything over what is it like twelve hundred dollars is grand theft. So technically, anybody, everybody associated with that Coinbase fiasco should be in jail as a, as a, as a felony. <laughs> if only it worked that way. So if I, yeah, so if you or I wash trade and, and, and stole $3,000 from somebody, we would go to jail for that. Yeah. You and I would. And that's but because the, they're a corporation, they get, they get a free pass. Yeah. That's the sad, uh, the sad truth of it. It's the system is designed to, um, enact uh punishment and sentences and stuff against you know individual humans but there's no way to do it for the uh i guess um legal entities other than like wrist slap fines and stuff because they become so big and so vital to perpetuating economies and you can't like how do you how do you punish a vastly wealthy corporate "Quote unquote person enough without um, without sending a message that uh, this is um, a disincentivization for you to uh, get this much money because then you're at risk of us punishing you if you step out of line." I mean, the current system encourages theft and stealing. Yeah, seriously, because because all because all all the SEC has done is show me that if I become a corporation, I can steal as much as I want, as long as I pay a twenty percent tax on it. Yeah, if you if you become big enough and wealthy enough that your failure and or punishment would send undue instability to the system, either by uh, the signal that it sends or the message that it sends to other people doing the same <laughs> shady thing to make money as you are <laughs> or uh but that's the thing it's like coinbase coinbase is 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 in an ecosystem that most people in government don't want to exist anyway right so the fact that they're not throwing people in coin from coinbase in jail which if coinbase collapsed would potentially hurt cryptocurrency as a whole which most governments would be really happy about <laughs> The fact that they're not willing to throw Brian Armstrong in jail for that is is mind-boggling to me because they, they literally are at that point saying, create any industry that we don't like, and as long as you make a certain amount of money, we'll just collect some of that money instead of sending you to jail. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're creating an incentive for th- to you know encouraging 
wash trading, encouraging theft, encouraging this. Just don't get caught until you're a millionaire. <laughs> it's really kind of scary that yeah, that this I, is the kind of system we're in now. I wonder about like like f- like free markets at a certain point, and I'm I'm just talking like uh, extra legally, like philosophically here. If there if, if a market's truly free. And there is an incentive to like self deal and wash trade with yourself, then like that's the free market being free type of thing, you know? So, like the fact that we've made it illegal, like, okay, obviously it's illegal because it sends um, the wrong messages to market participants if you're self dealing. But I guess if these permissionless cryptocurrency systems extend far enough and grow far enough, eventually, we're going to reach a pretty sizable marketplace where there's some kind of incentive just to stack volume wherever you can. You know, you could even argue that potentially it could be on Uniswap V3. Let's say it's like stablecoin for stablecoin. And the spread between two stable coins is so tight that everybody's parking their like designated liquidity areas like right in the sub, 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 sub cent difference between the two. And they're earning liquidity pool fees from it back and forth. And everybody's got like micro shaves of differences away from each other's pools. And eventually that's going to move into some self-trading. Just because yeah. the morass is so big, like how do you even know whether your one algorithm is fulfilling orders on the other algorithm side? I think we're getting into that like in marketplaces, just uh, running multiple strategies normally, and it's possible to still identify it and tease it out, but eventually it's not going to be possible possible to do that. And um, I don't know, I feel like the illegality of at least wash trading precipitated by the permissionless crypto markets is going to going to be subject to revision at some point and yeah i mean uh, i think eventually it'll start to it'll start to tease itself out and not be an issue anymore but like i don't know there's always going to be something new yeah and 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 when you don't really kind of crack down on what was currently illegal, you're just encouraging people to find the next illegal thing. <laughs> well, man, it's like why are, not? Yeah, well, like, people why, are seeking, why wouldn't I? People are seeking yield, and and it's almost like the rules within the sort of DeFi ape into this, ape into that, hope you get profit system. They're so far removed from the rules that we understand generally in daily life. Yeah. They're set by sort of the software. And in a lot of cases, like you might not know that um, I'm coming up with like a ridiculous example here, but like this, this coin is to fund like purse snatchers, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You yeah, don't know exactly. necessarily if like uh, PSNC is purse snatcher coin and oh shoot, I just bought this and I'm funding a child crime ring. <laughs> right? Like there's an abstraction I mean, all there. Of it, yeah. Anybody could just put up any website and say, we're saving the animals. Like I just aped into something about that's some like quote unquote Australian cryptocurrency that, that saves animals. Yeah. Just because I'm an idiot, you know, but like they could be totally like clubbing baby seals to death <laughs> and then, and then posting a picture of a baby orangutan that they just saved on the website. And I'd be like, oh yeah, it's yeah. like, but that's just it. Like, that's why you, that's why you need watchdogs. That's why you need people who, I mean, in, in any government, you can't trust the government. It's <laughs> like your job is to not trust the government. 
Yeah. That's why you have watchdogs. That's why you have, you know, different branches of government. That's why you have unelected and, and elected people. That's what it's just like you have to have all these safeguards in place. And the whole reason why America's built out the way. And and when people say I don't trust the government, my first response is, well, that's dumb because you elected them. But my second response is, well, that's good. You should be you should be supporting watchdogs. Yeah. Like funding watchdogs who do all the work that you're not obviously doing to to to, to keep them in check. And I think we need more crypto watchdogs and, and, and I don't know, like pay into them or something like that. Or I I don't, maybe like insurance or something. Who knows? I don't know. I always wonder if like, is it a slippery slope? Like since we're all swimming in the water of free market capitalism, (laughs) eventually there's a point where the watchdogs, it's, uh, become incentivized to become paid off. And then who watches the watchdogs and who watches those watchdogs. And then I, I, it's unions it's are a perfect of, example. Yeah. Like uh, unions get you get unions get strong and powerful and like and who's watching the unions. Yeah, exactly. They're like and so it's I, just like I'm a big uh I'm a big fan of unions. Um Yeah, me too. But, but the whole when they get too much power, it's like a it's a devastating thing. I mean, um I've seen the work of uh a un uh, of a person within a union with too much power and the per, uh, a person getting paid one third the amount that needs to make economic output to keep their job. And yeah. they're both extremes on a scale. And I know that the sweet spot is somewhere in the middle, but it's really far distant from both of the, the things I observe. And it's like, man, this was supposed to be a solution, but it's just multiplied the problem in a different direction. Like this is a, this is a human problem. We're talking about human problems that crypto doesn't quite come close to solving yet at all <laughs> well, because crypto is made by humans. Yeah. So it's like any, it's, it's like you said, like when, you know, software is doing this and software is in the background, but like software is created by human beings. So it's just, it's going to be just as, as, as fallible as, as we are because we're the ones creating it and it's going to have all our own biases and all our own, you know, like if you have a bunch of libertarians creating cryptocurrency, of course they're going to make it, beneficial for libertarians they're not going to make it beneficial for bleeding heart snowflakes in there you know as as they would call them they're not going to make it so it's it's an equal opportunity level playing field they're going to make it so it's the first person in who took the risk gets all the rewards yeah definitely definitely as systems become more complex the tools can begin to resemble um the the will and intent and even like the politics of the creator. And that's why I think like, um, I guess, except for in hindsight, the people early riding free, the simplicity of Bitcoin as a tool just conceptually is like, it's pretty easy to agree that like, okay, this is just a new way for, for money to look and be sovereign to something that's not a state. Outside of that, though, like I can definitely agree that the reason why I I, uh, far be it for me to like um, kind of ponder whether whether or not Satoshi was a libertarian or even exactly what his politics were. But definitely I can see why libertarians were the first people to recognize the value of Bitcoin is because their position is the closest to um, a simple tool that sort of puts sovereignty into a mix where there where none really existed before. Yeah. And I mean, I, I try my best to under, understand every sort of political school of thought. Um, and I find myself agreeing with like facets of, of many of them. And I, I wish, you know, that it had been every sort of political faction discovering Bitcoin at the same time, not just libertarians, because I feel like that did a lot of social damage to it that we're kind of only paying for now um, in terms of like just completely whack narratives about like proof of work mining and stuff and, and environmentalists uh, being mad at how much energy proof of work takes up. Have you got any thoughts on that? Oh, dude. <laughs> Hit me. I mean, 
I know you're like the proof of work king, but like, oh no, no, is, I'm it's a, a, it's long, a, long retired. But uh. <laughs> okay, I mean, it is it is an is ecological disaster. It's a nightmare, and 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 I think and I agree with you in the sense of if we had more um, left leaning egalitarians in the early stages of Bitcoin, I think they would have fought against unlimited power, you know, receiving the highest rewards. They would have they would have come up with a different way, like like proof of proof of time, or you know how much energy, you're, like how much how much time you're putting into mining versus how much hash you're putting in, or like just something like figure out something because right now it's a runaway train, and the fact that Bitcoin's using more energy for one percent of of the of the population, so so like like you know like one percent of the of the planet is actually using Bitcoin. And it's already using more energy than like a few countries combined in in Europe. That's crazy. So imagine if a 100% of people start like own Bitcoin and use Bitcoin. What's going to happen at that point? Like this is a th- this is interesting to me because I've um, I've heard the the environmental danger argument a lot. From and even even in early times when you could compare the amount of energy that the Bitcoin network was using to, oh, I don't even remember what the first benchmark was, but it was um, it was a lot. Uh, it's it was a lot then. It's it's like way 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 more than that now. Yeah, and uh, and I'm I don't think that's wrong, but you'll have to hear me out on it because <laughs> yeah. I know but- that. Energy use in general is another sort of conceptual water that we swim in. And our allocations and our analyses of it aren't always as cut and dried as they should be comparatively. And one that I liked to use was around about 2016. There was a really good stat where you could see the Bitcoin energy used X, the Bitcoin network used X amount of terawatt hours per year. And US Christmas lights used a little, it was somewhere in the same order of magnitude. So I'm not sure if it was like half to two times as much. But if you take like the the net benefit from the energy use of the Bitcoin network versus the net benefit of the energy use of American Christmas lights. I think you can have a pretty compelling argument that Bitcoin's probably more worthwhile and that if we only turned off the Christmas lights this year and every year, maybe uh, we would be better off in, in the world from a, from an energy use standpoint. And okay, so, uh, yeah. Oh, so, sorry, sorry. Oh, I know. Uh, I, I want to hear your response to that actually. So, my response is the vast majority of Americans are using Christmas lights and the vast majority of Americans aren't using Bitcoin. Right. So if you're, if you're trying to compare energy uses of less than 1% of the planet to, you know, every single American and you're saying, hey, look, every single American is using just as much energy as 0.001% of Americans, uh, you know, mining Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm going to be like, well, what? The, of course they're using more energy. Yeah. Every single person in the, in the country is, is doing it. No one's, no one's using Bitcoin and it's already using more energy than every single American using uh, Christmas tree lights. I get so what imagine you're... what's going to happen when every single person is using Bitcoin. <laughs> it's going to be like ten thousand planets worth of, of Christmas lights going on all at the same time. I get, I <laughs> like, get what you're saying, and I think the way to, I think the the way to think about that is if we're equating unnecessary energy use with with harm rather than with benefit, and we're looking to reduce our energy use. Uh, if we, if we say that like, ener- um, I guess, uh, frivolous energy use harms everybody on the planet an equal amount, that's the lens to look at the Christmas lights versus Bitcoin statistic at See, that time. That's the narrative that Bitcoiners keep trying to push. That's, that's 
it's a false narrative. Is it false? Yeah, because because here's the reason. Yeah, is the natural order of technology is we like something, and we and now it's part of our life, and Bitcoiners and people on the right keep saying. People on the on the left want to take away your energy. They want to take away your right to use a phone and, and take away your right to use the TV and take away the right to have all your Christmas tree lights. And, and no one on the left is ever saying that. No one on the left is saying, turn off all your lights. Yeah, it's a mystery. No one on the left is saying, yeah. So what they're saying is, we need to stop using coal to run your lights. We need to stop using fluorescent bulbs when we have LED bulbs that take one one thousandth amount of energy yeah. to produce just as much light. And what you look at something like the new Mac M1 that uses like 5% of the energy of the, of the previous, of, of the model from the, from the year before to be able to do just as much, if not more work. I can now play video games at 60 FPS on a Mac mini because they have figured out a way to create a product that uses very little energy and produces massive, massive output. I wonder about the carbon footprint of the new Mac M2 next year and the carbon footprint of the new Mac M1 this year that replaces the new Mac last year, right? Well, but that's the thing is my last MacBook lasted me eight years. Ah. So Apple has a tendency of creating products that use you know, quality quality components that last a pretty long time. Now, they're a free market company just like everybody else, so they're going to try to convince you to to upgrade. But versus like Android where you're, you know, you're using a plastic phone most of the time, those things fall apart and they're not updating their software. You know, and, and Apple says, "Hey, you know, we're going to guarantee 4 years of upgrades, of software upgrades to oh. if you buy something." So if you buy anything, we guarantee we will we will support it for four full cycles, four full years. So like they really you know they they walk that line, and I and I push back on Apple a lot you know, but they they definitely are trying to do things to make it less of a consumer throwaway system. Huh. But so that's my that's my issue with Bitcoin is you have a product that the whole purpose is to make it harder over time. To, to get rewarded, which means you need stronger and stronger and stronger machines. That's actually so whereas whereas everything the else, case. they're they're making it they're you know they're they're asking for less energy. So like my new Mac, I'm using less energy. My new light bulbs that I bought are LED. I'm using less energy for right. the same exact output. But Bitcoin, you need to produce, you need to use more energy to get the same exact output. And then they say, okay, now you got to use even more energy and we're going to cut that we're going to cut the reward in half. <laughs> so now yeah. you got to use more energy to get less reward. So that that part of it is um is actually something that is a is a function of the competition for the remaining mined bitcoin block rewards plus whatever fees are getting uh spent and earned back by miners and oh, no, I, mean, I, I understand why but yeah. i'm saying that's the reason why like to me the whole light bulb christmas christmas bulb uh you know christmas lights thing is is a complete fallacy because you know pe- everyone's doing it you know quote unquote everyone i'm being hyperbolic yeah, yeah, yeah. everyone but most people are doing it most people get a lot of personal joy out of it I don't I don't see a lot of people getting a lot of personal joy out of mining Bitcoin. I did. I'll be your counterexample. I have a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, okay, so that's one person. I don't see a lot. Yeah, yeah. I like, totally, I don't see I totally more than I don't saying. see more than one percent of the population of the human of the planet's population getting you know feeling a reward. Because I what is it? So like point one 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 or like point zero 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 one percent of the population is actually mining Bitcoin? That's probably so it's like a true. fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction. So they're the ones that are, they're the only ones that are actually getting pleasure out of mining Bitcoin. Well, not even because uh, there's actually some uh, projections that uh, there are mostly economic projections, but the profitability of miners is uh, 
supposed to trend toward zero. Like you're just um, the ones securing the network. And aside from like a small amount of speculative premium that decreases as Bitcoin's future becomes more and more assured, you're actually um, supposed to be barely profitable. But here's sort of the argument for Bitcoin's energy usage. And I'm not denying that um, it's like abstractable, like it is designed fundamentally to consume energy, to do work, to make it hard to oppose by consuming energy to do oppositional work that would destabilize the network. And, and that conceptually, like I can totally get behind. And then the rest of it is sort of a moral comparison that we could argue towards the ends of the earth saying like, is it worth spending this energy? Is it not worth spending this energy? And we could, we could probably like research and pull stats and, uh, and spend like a long time doing it. So here's where I think, and I'm always, I always come back to the free open source software part of it. Cause I think it's uh, sort of uh, underappreciated con- part of the concept of the whole, like uh, I guess uh, latent gift that Bitcoin still has to, to um, or that we still have to appreciate that Bitcoin has sort of bestowed on us. Yeah. Is that the technology of Bitcoin, um, and of just blockchains is free to replicate. And we're now going to be to give proof of work a trial by fire. So regardless of whether I'm right in saying proof of work is okay and it's worth the energy we use and it always will be, or you're right in saying proof of work uh, should be stopped uh, or at least lowered until it's commensurate with other uses of energy that don't, uh, that, that reduce harm as far as possible. We have, Lots of competing options. Um, I've been staking proof of stake cryptocurrencies since basically I started. It was just another thing to do alongside mining. And I still stake proof of stake cryptocurrencies, even when my miners are off because it's summer and they make my home too hot. I'm staking, I'm proof of staking cryptocurrencies and they're using a fraction of the energy. Like, uh, proof of stake is definitely not as secure as proof of work. But as long as it's not worth it for an attacker to attack because they have the same funds at stake as anybody else, then it's okay. And those are just simple early proof of stake models that work in sort of a wallet that looks just like a Bitcoin wallet. Then you have all these next gen proof of stake models like uh, Cosmos and like Ethereum's new version and like all this other Nano. stuff. Yeah, and Nano as well. Like there's um, there's a lot of different options and insofar as we can sort of agree that we could never agree on the energy usage we will get our trial by fire with the competition from proof of stake cryptocurrencies and more importantly the narratives surrounding them if we agree that truly definitively figuring out how harmful the energy usage of it of proof of work is relative to all the other harmful and non-harmful uses of energy, uh, whether it's actually a net benefit or not. Like if it's in doubt, let the proof of stake narratives take their course. Let's start using it because I've been using it for years and it works for me just like Bitcoin has. And let's let the free open source software and the uptake of that take care of it. So if you don't like the proof of the the energy that proof of work uses and you would rather make a moral choice to use and keep and store and stake and DeFi with proof of stake cryptocurrency that is your free right because it's all interoperable money and uh your money's kind of good anywhere crypto is good so uh let's do it that way yeah i mean in, in no way i don't want people to think that i'm trying to say we should shut down bitcoin i'm right. i'm I'm a free market guy, and but I think that there's so America. If you watch John Oliver, last week's was one of those ones where it's just like, oh, fuck. Now I feel like shit after watching it. <laughs> um, he talks about plastic, plastic use, plastic consumption, plastic, um, just like the whole the whole market of plastic and how we've how we've ramped up. Like we've produced 
like 80% of plastic in the last 10 years. Oh my God. Or something, something ridiculous like that. And now we're all ingesting between like one and two teaspoons of plastic a day. <laughs> what? It's in all of our, it's, it's in all of our fish. It's in all of our salt. It's in, it's in every, like microplastic is in everything now. Oh my God. Because it doesn't really break down. It just kind of breaks apart. Huh. Um, and so it's this whole thing of like, well, do you use plastic or like, so, so, so America has this thing where we don't charge the polluter for the pollution they make. Uh huh. We make Americans, we make, we make everybody else pay to clean it up. Whereas most other countries, they have a, they have a polluter pay law where the, the person who's creating the pollution has to pay to clean it up. Huh. And, you know, and so it's like we could easily do that with a carbon tax on if you're mining Bitcoin, you have to pay a carbon tax for all the, all the carbon you produce. And so that would encourage people to switch over to solar or wind or whatever. And, and, and also that's why I talk about nano. That's why I talk about Ethereum. That's why I talk about proof of stake. That's why I talk about like, that's why I talk about these other things because I want people to make conscious decisions for you know what they're doing with their money there's a reason why clean energy etfs etfs mutual funds whatever, whatever. Uh, low cost lo- low cost index funds um there's a reason why those are skyrocketing in, in, on wall street cuz people are like i don't want my money to go to chevron anymore yeah i don't feel good even though i'm making a profit every year by investing in Shell or or Chevron, I don't feel good about myself because I, I'm actually not making a profit because the pollution they put into the air is actually hurting my children or my family. And our medical bills are higher because my kids have asthma. So the money that I made in my portfolio is actually all gone on, on inhalers for my, for my children. So I actually didn't make a profit. So why do I keep investing in these in these companies that I have, you know, immediate profit and then long term loss? Yeah, yeah. That's just well, not smart from, from an economic standpoint. So why would true. I do that? It's true. It's true. So, well, let me. So I think like, that's this, why. Yeah. Oh, go I, ahead. I get go it. Ahead. I get it. Let Let me give you this example then of a way that Bitcoin is being mined right now, and get your take on it. Um, cause a lot of where Bitcoin mining is moving is not where like coal matters, but for the past, I would say four years now, it's been, um, Bitcoin miners in their spirit of competition have been taking up wherever there's excess natural resource energy that would normally just be, uh, wasted. So they take up residence at dams, which when they get too full, they just got to spill it all, right? And there's nowhere for that energy to go. But if you have miners on site, you can power the Bitcoin miners with it for a while. Or there's well, one guy that I like on Twitter, uh, his name's uh, SG Barbour. And what he's done is create these little um, shipping containers full of miners. And he deploys them at, uh, I believe, oil mining or some kind of drilling, but wherever you drill for oil, you're going to find natural gas flares. And you can't, if the natural gas is stranded, you can't use it. Like you've just got to burn it off, which is obviously terrible for the environment and also wasteful. But what he does is his little shipping containers, he plants them on top of a natural gas deposit. And instead of burning it off, he uses it to much more cleanly power a bunch of bitcoin miners and it, well he's still burning it off it's let's uh, to be to be clear it's still producing the same amount of of co2 in the air he's just instead of the energy being wasted he's using that energy to mine some bitcoin right i, but I was still, under the impression still, that it's less uh damaging to just straight off light the light the flare on fire and burn it all away no than it it, is it, to, they're, they're still lighting the, they're, they're still lighting that fire but they're but they're capturing that energy. Okay, okay. And they're using it. To, they're using it to to mine the Bitcoin. So the, like the same amount of CO two is being is being released into the air. Right. So it's so it's still damaging from the industry standpoint, but it is not any more damaging than it would be without it. Okay, got it. That Correct. that may not yeah. that may not have been uh, yeah. the 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 really good example I was hoping for. But definitely, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, definitely. Well, the, I mean, it, it, it does it does give. 
the person who's mining the Bitcoin, they can say, hey, I'm not adding to my, my Bitcoin didn't add to the CO2 being released in the air. It was going to be released either way. Right. So they can say they, they can say my my Bitcoin is carbon neutral. Kind of. Kind of. You know, but it's, it's on the it's, back it's, of whatever else is being drilled for, which is not necessarily carbon neutral. Exactly. And I don't yeah. think you can really like if you if you look at there's always a path to follow on externalities where you can find you can eventually find your way to non carbon neutrality, <laughs> you know, like manufacturing yeah, I mean, of anything is probably not carbon neutral if you want it. And if you want to take it to that point. So it's, it's and I, I, get I, I think people need to remember that carbon neutral means does carbon neutral doesn't mean you're not producing carbon anymore. Right. It means that you're capturing as much carbon as you're putting out. So it's like, like, and this is another thing people on the right and Bitcoin say, like, you know, they, they want to take away all, all of our, uh, you know, all of our energy. And this is, I don't know. If you produce a hundred pounds of CO2, we want you to capture a hundred pounds of CO2. Got it. And put it back in the ground. We want you to be responsible for what you create and clean up after yourself. That's it. Yeah. That, that I can get behind. You know? That I can get behind. Don't, don't stop making plastic. Just make sure you recycle as much plastic as you produce and actually recycle it and break it down. Yeah. Recycle like that, it in that's, a way that, that's, that's carbon that's neutral what, too. <laughs> yeah. Like that, that's what polluter pay is. Is So you take responsibility for what you put into the planet. Yeah. And most countries think like, oh, that's pretty much common sense. <laughs> Let's if do that. If you go over to somebody's house- <laughs> And you spill something, clean it up. Don't expect them to clean it up for you. Like we, so yeah. So like, so we had Jason on the show a while back, parabolic. Um, he's on Twitter. He's parabolic rise or parabolic something. I forget his name. Parabolic Trav um, is. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So that's Jason. Yeah. So we had him on and he does something where he recycles old tires and uses the energy produced in that in that um breakdown to mine bitcoin and ethereum and a couple other things cool so, so that's a perfect example of you know people are doing legitimate stuff but you know the response to the whole dam thing is people are saying yeah well we, we use water from dams it's like okay well studies have shown that dams are one of the most ecological ecologically disastrous thing to nature that that we can do as human beings it destroys it destroys the river and it destroys all the ecology around it. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, because you know fish can no longer go up there, so uh, you know all the all the animals that were living off the fish can't can't go there anymore. So and all the animals that were living off the animals that lived off the fish can't live around there anymore. So it just come, it destroys the entire habitat. No kidding. Here's me thinking hydroelectric power was like relatively clean. Well, I mean, if you can do it in a way where it doesn't completely block off the river and allow things to go up and down the river naturally yeah it's totally clean yeah okay <laughs> but it's not easy to so, do that without a i mean when you have the hoover dam there aren't many fish going upstream past the hoover dam fair enough fair enough <laughs> you know so like so like, these are things that that people in, immediately think of that like oh no we're, we're using stuff that's already there without understanding the long-term um negative externalities around that and why it's damaging for that to be there in the first place. People are like, "Oh yeah, you know, we're using we're using burnoff from oil fields." Well, we don't want oil fields there because <laughs> oil fields are toxic, and the release of methane is one of the worst gases you can release into the atmosphere. One of the worst CO two contributors is methane. That's why we don't want capped wells anymore. That's why we don't want wells at all huh. because these things are completely damaging to to our our ability to breathe. Our ability to breathe, and we have to argue with people about that. Yeah, clearly, I have to do some more looking into the, the, all the different <laughs> environmental ramifications of of energy use and and stuff like that. Because uh, I was, I've always been sort of operating under the impression that, like, okay, well, if we've got like, if we've got a dam that's you know already been built fifty years ago and has a lot of natural life left, and it has like uh, energy that it's already producing like you know the um the that's able to be captured then it's worth using that to mine bitcoin but like don't go build a new dam in an environmentally beautiful green untouched natural paradise 
to go yeah. buy Bitcoin and then claim your environmental uh, friendliness because that's not kind of how it works. Is, is yeah, but but also it's the idea of like as a species we're we're continuing to, to reproduce and need more and more and more land and resources. And the sooner we can get rid of the old technology that was damaging to our ecosystem, the the easier it'll, it'll be for us to continue to to increase our size. Because right now those things are actually limiting us. Like we're, it's those things are limiting our ability to fish. So huge swaths of populations across the planet now can't sustain from fishing huh. because of plastic, of dams, of um, nitrogen from farming run off it. So like, if you know anything about the, the, the Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico, it's a complete dead zone for fishing now. Really? Cause all the nitrogen they used from farming went down the rivers, you know, wash, washed off the farms down the rivers and there's too much nitrogen in the water and fish can't really breathe. So they're just not producing in the way they, they used to. So, so fishermen, shrimp, like pretty much every single shrimp you buy now is from China. Wow. Because American fish, fishermen can't farm, uh, can't uh, get shrimp anymore. Because yeah, of, I, I bet you there's dead spots like that all over the place. Yeah, I mean, and so like, th- there's all these different things where it's like, okay, well, you know, we should wait till we come up with a better solution for nitrogen. Well, no, do you want to eat? Because if you want to eat, we need to stop using nitrogen in, in fertilizer now. Because it's going to take 10, 20, maybe thirty years for the Earth to fix itself. And and make the Gulf of Mexico no longer a dead zone. So like it, it'll happen, it'll eventually happen, but like it's not it's not going to naturally happen on on our terms. Yeah, not if not if you we know, keep mo- exacerbating <laughs> and make and and you know switching over uh, switching over hab- habits to uh, less impactful stuff. Well, that's exactly. why I'm kind of happy to say like, hey, let let's see how far proof of stake goes. Like, uh, yeah, and absolutely. and let's see let's see how much. Uh, damage it mitigates i i have a feeling that the uh the proof of work bell can't be unrung at this juncture and yeah. that if we want all this stuff to work like we have to to a certain point we don't have to love it or ha- be completely happy about it but we have to accept that bitcoin and its proof of work system underpins a lot of the value we're building on top of even philosophically and so we have to at least continue to push it towards the least environmentally impactful uh, ways of doing it. And we're going to use more energy on not just Bitcoin, but like pretty much everything else and drive it towards renewables. And I would be completely happy to, uh, to make progress in that regard, but whatever we can't let's, uh, encourage people to make a more moral choice insofar as that matters to them and they understand that it matters to them. And if they choose to use proof of stake cryptocurrencies that over time get proven to be just as robust and just as useful, then let them, let them uh, make that choice too. Yeah. I mean, if, if you're an investor, the, the, the thing to remember is tipping points happen fast. Yeah. So like, you know, South Africa, Apartheid ended quickly. It didn't happen over time. It happened over the course of a weekend. And all those people who were supportive of apartheid were fucking murdered in the streets. <laughs> because over time, a bunch of countries just started divesting in South Africa. And we're like, we're not going to invest a dollar in a country that, in essence, has slavery still. Right. And then enough people divested where the people were able to rise up and be like, all right, cool. We're done with you guys. I mean, yeah. just murdered them all in the streets. It's like and that, that you could it happens, almost it happens quick. You could see the writing on the wall. Like there was there was fair warning of that. I'm I'm not um very historically knowledgeable about the the de- the details of South African apartheid, but uh, I I'm sure that you could see that coming. But increasingly these days, when we're when we've got like such a bigger blast of information, things tend to do the jump from gradually to suddenly a lot more quickly, a lot more often. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, that's, uh, it's not easy to, to, to stay, stay abreast of it all, you know? No. And that's why, so like when I, when I tell people, it's like, Hey, there's, you know, there's a reason why clean energy is making a, a, a big, a big run 
on Wall Street. And if you don't see that, and then on top of that, Wall Street's making a big jump into Bitcoin, which is not clean energy. The majority of it is not is not mined on clean energy. So the people who are investing in Wall Street are going to see that and have and there's going to be a big backlash. And so what we're seeing in, in the Bitcoin space is a lot of misinformation and disinformation being spread around, trying to defend, oh, no, no, energy use is good. Bitcoin wasting all this energy just shows how robust and strong it is. It's actually good for the planet. They're, they're doing all the things that Shell and Big Oil did and Big Tobacco did when people were starting to push back against the dangers of, of, those, of those two things. It's like we knew Big Oil knew about global warming in the 70s, and they did a big disinformation campaign huh. trying to convince people that oil was safe. We knew tobacco was bad and addictive, and nicotine was addictive. Big Tobacco did a big push you know, uh, misinformation campaign trying to say smoking was that, like, wasn't dangerous for you. It wasn't bad for you. It didn't cause cancer. So the Bitcoiners are doing the same playbook that Big Oil and Big Tobacco did. And this is what I try to warn people. It didn't end well for Big Tobacco. If you were a big investor in Big Tobacco, you're not making a ton of money anymore the yeah, way you were back yeah. then. So if your goal is to find... Is to, is to be as profitable as you were before, you need to find the next thing. Don't write out the old thing because the old thing is going to go to zero. Eventually, big tobacco is just going to run, you know, dry up, especially if vape, if they can figure out a way to safely vape. Yeah. Big tobacco has gone at that point. Now, so I wonder like about you gotta, that because those were centralized industries that, you know, directly did something harmful, like as it was it was sort of in, entrenched in their business cycle like they had to big tobacco had to keep pushing these things that they knew affected people's health and big oil has to keep people addicted to like the the gasoline autom automobile world and i don't think like bitcoiners as much as we like to as much as even i like to joke that they're all like uh, a a cult in some ways or behave cult like they're not like a monolith with a central story and and direct narrative for that like like the bitcoin network could use and this is this is my like hope for it long term is that it could use only as much 100% clean energy as is required to prevent anybody else from using an equivalent equivalent amount of any other kind of energy to attack it and destabilize it via a 51% attack or whatever. And Yeah, but what have we seen with big blocks versus small blocks? Oh, like we've seen what happens when people push back and try to make a change. Well, we There's saw too much money we in saw small blockers. We saw a fork and then we saw economically one one proof of work chain over time clearly 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 went out yeah and that uh and and you know that's and that's nothing crypto changed. yeah not well nothing really changed from an energy standpoint i don't think it was like it was a secondary issue on the table there but oh no i'm sorry i just meant i just meant like that's a perfect example of de like decentralized things take forever to change yeah because you need consensus like the u.s government's a perfect example like trying to get enough consensus to to ch pass laws it's very difficult and then you throw in gerrymandering and states with you know ten thousand people in them having just as much voting weight as states like california with you know 50 million people in them. right right like you have, like that's the thing. Like with 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 Bitcoin, is you've got these people who were early adopters and who, who are essentially billionaires now because of it. They're not going to allow a lot of changes that are going to affect that. Their, and not even that. So not only so, not only just people who who got in early, but people who started investing in the in the ecosystem early. They've invested hundreds of millions of dollars now into making sure Bitcoin is getting to as many people. And, and people and people are using their services and products. They're going to be the ones pushing back the hardest against Bitcoin making a change and potentially being less profitable. 
Right. And there almost because, isn't ha- there isn't um there's there's sort of a trend and it's it's natural as Bitcoin becomes more and stays decentralized is that it's called protocol ossification where like it's a feature that it's hard to change. And I yeah. think I think like the whole open source part of it that I keep haranguing about is the blow off valve for you know a lot of people especially in the early days if they wanted to change bitcoin and they found that you know even when it was relatively centralized and the core devs looked at their github commits and were like yeah this is stupid no thanks then those people would get in a huff and go away and create another cryptocurrency and most of the time it didn't survive because the idea was bad or the network effect wasn't enough and sometimes it did survive but this is the this is sort of like the the protective power of you know leaving aside the whether whether or not bitcoin is a net good for its energy consumption argument for a second this is where like at least let the bitcoin protocol ossify and even if it has to be um net environmentally bad for a while it will get better and alternatives will present a narrative and or actual in less environmentally harmful alternative where if those incentives line up bitcoin will still be able to survive use less energy to accomplish what it needs to and still remain a stable foundation economically for all this other stuff to, to proliferate that's kind of my optimistic view anyway yeah but if this goes back to our argument about jeff bezos is the one driving the car and we're in the back seat so until we actually kick him out and we take over the driving. So Bitcoin is super centralized. And you just and you just showed a perfect example of it is you have a core dev team and they decide. Right? Yeah. I like mean they decide if it gets if it gets, you know, added to the to the to the whatever, or like, you know, get add, added to an update. Or I mean, it's it's a pretty centralized project. Like I you mean, and I don't have a say in in, in in the change of the code. Right. Well, the like, oh, core well, dev well, team well, is, you, is you trusted just... to make like, like non, um, like, r- like rough updates in their, the open source of that. It means that like, it's pretty difficult, if not impossible to sneak something through or have the core dev team push something through like, uh, everybody running a node. If there's anything fishy, they don't want to, um, they, w- they just won't upgrade and, and the fork won't happen. So like so it's pretty easy last, to like remember, remember the last inflationary bug that they found? I wasn't in Bitcoin they at the time, but I recall, yeah. I recall the story. And they didn't tell anybody that they found it. They they created a fix for it and they spammed all the all the people running nodes and said, You have to upgrade. It's it's like ma- it's like mandatory. Yeah, that you was have a, to upgrade. That was a different and stage of the just, Lindy curve, though. That was like and they er, and this er, was like no, this was like a year or two ago. Wait, what? Yeah, the latest one. The latest one happened like a year or two ago, and they cr- and they pushed out an update. They didn't tell anybody what the update was for. They said you have to trust us. You have to do this, and everybody just did it. Everybody trusted the core team. And they updated without knowing what, what what the update was about. I'm I'm trying to remember exactly what this is about because I think I know what you're talking about, and I I maybe I'm mistaken, but I have a completely different understanding. It was a Bitcoin what. core dev, and he found an inflationary bug in BCH, and he told them about it. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And then he turned around and realized that same inflationary bug was in BTC. And they fixed it, and they pushed out this this update to, to to fix that, and didn't tell anybody what was in it. They just said you have to trust us. I mean, and by uh, you know, they didn't tell anybody in the sense of they didn't tell the mass public. Right. I'm sure that they they told a few people here and there, but like, it wasn't on CoinDesk. It wasn't on Coin Telegraph. Big inflationary bug. You need to you need to update your your nodes right away. Blah blah. Like, they just said. This is a this is a really important update. You really need to fix. You really need to update right away. So it's like it. It, it kind of goes back to the whole thing. It's like nothing's really decentralized. Right. Right. It's kind of it's kind of a meme, you know. I think it's somewhere between a meme and like 
there's it's definitely a spectrum like bitcoin is not an apex of pure decentralization in all its forms and facets as as some people might like to uh, extol it for but yeah. i think yeah now i remember that that pretty well like where it was discovered on bch and then discovered in bitcoin um as well and i think like the um if i remember right it was a because bitcoin is such a larger network it was more of a nothing burger on BTC and less of a cause for alarm. Uh, but that wouldn't stop people from trying to attack it. Yeah. And uh, for BCH though, because it's such a, mu- such a smaller network, it was of much more concern. Yeah. Um, but I, I think you're right. You know, like the ability that a, uh, for a core dev team to sort of silently push out an update um that prevents a problem like that this recently and you know not give node runners explicit information that this is what's being patched essentially well, and also it like, tells it tells a person like me if i had enough money that i could try to spoof the core dev team ooh. and then push out an uh and then push out an update that gave me the ability to, in, you know, to artificially inflate Bitcoin and know that the node runners would all do it without checking. That's what I learned from that. That'd be nuts. I wonder how that would work because you'd either have to mint the Bitcoins right away or well, if China, do a big double well, so spend. China, China, has, China has more than 50% of the, of the hash power. For, for BTC. So if China got together and took over all the mining farms and then spoofed the devs, like this would be like a, like, like a multi-year project. You could slowly do it, like slowly, like with shell corporations, take over the vast majority of mining and people wouldn't really think about it because everybody already knows that the majority of mining is done in China. Right. So it wouldn't be like some big, so then they slowly start spoofing accounts and have them lined up and then just do a big attack all at once. Yeah, and then over the I, course of I like often, a few weeks, I often wonder start- if the game theory of keeping the network alive at this juncture is um, is the main glue that keeps the status quo in place, even if geographically there's a a, a very um, non democratic regime in charge of fifty percent of the Bitcoin hash rate. And yeah, uh, what I've been even more um, sort of concerned of, because there's a, that's a lot of like logistical machinery to take over, even though it is like very much centralized to one sort of region in China, uh, the mining pools that are in China, because some people send their hash that's not in China to Chinese mining pools because yeah. they have the lowest variance. and if a lot of people are just kind of like waiting for rewards and not really checking, there's a certain very narrow, but critical enough window of fuckery that you could go through yeah. just at the pool level alone. Um, and I don't know what form it would take. It would be very um, shady, like a, uh, like an electrical storm causing server power outages at the um, the main pool server and also the backup or something. Like I, I, I puzzle over potential attacks against Bitcoin all the time. I think existing nodes would reject a supply increase immediately, and that's not really a concern. But a big, know, big, big double spend, a big double spend could get pushed through. With something yeah. like that. And then it would just depend like, you know, how big, whose coins got double spent. Because you have to have a lot of Bitcoin in the first place to do a really big double spend. Um, and then your sort of, your long-term how much gambit is. A is a yeah, million? You, I don't know. I don't know what, what it would be. But your long-term gambit is like, it has to be big enough that you get away with like a lot, but not so yeah. big that it doesn't end up uh, damaging the perceived value of the Bitcoin network and confidence in it 
over the long term. It's like, okay. Unless you guys- your goal is just to sell it right away. Like yeah, people. well, it depends what the double spend is for. And as as these like uh, decentralized marketplaces get bigger and have more volume, that sort of increases the size of the honeypot to doing it. But uh, it's um, like I'm not at the forefront of mining anymore, so I don't really know. And I guess I, as much as most other people, just... Um, place more and more confidence in the game theory equilibrium of it right now, where now you've got something that's too big to fail, but the invested parties in it are sort of all at uh, a place where it's worth it to leave the borders where they are rather than make a, make a probe across there and back, like rather than commit an act of an act of war or an act of destabilization. It's uh, it's enough to just kind of, uh, just kind of plug away at where you're at. Well, that's also that's also with the idea that the person doing it wants Bitcoin to stick around. Yeah, that's true. I have trouble imagining a person who, like at this point, really wants it to go away. Even even governments, they're like sort of. I, I've always thought of the the position of governments, even though they didn't want it early on. Um it's much easier for a government that can print infinite fiat dollars to co-opt it either via supply or via um, controlling of the mining or whatever. Like if you can print infinite fiat money to buy whatever you want, um, I know you can, you can co-opt it many other ways. People think that the price of Bitcoin is legitimate. And I'm like, it's mainly based on printed fiat that isn't backed by anything. (laughs) It's like, but that's the thing. Like eventually, like if, Print if the printed fiat value of Bitcoin becomes meaningless, then the printed fiat value of all the other stuff we need to like the loaf of bread that we need to feed our family to becomes meaningless too. And then yeah. that's the whole hyper Bitcoinization argument is that like oh this is the only stable unit of account we have left. So gradually then suddenly now it's all got to be priced in Bitcoin so that we can <laughs> denominate stuff par- properly and like the freedom of trade that we rely on for our capitalist ocean doesn't uh, completely and immediately dry up. <laughs> so, I mean, Bitcoiners also use a, a really common Republican tactic as well is they rail against something that they're doing, you know, they're secretly doing. And, and they, the Rep- Republicans got caught doing it for the last four years, pretty much every single day. But you know, Bitcoiners claim to hate the infinite printing of money, but that infinite printing of money by the U.S. is it the thing that's driving the price of Bitcoin up? So yeah. they can keep, they can keep railing on it to have the world think that that's their view, but in actuality, they want the U.S. government to keep printing money because it's driving up their ability to one day if the US were to collapse they can say they have this inflated bitcoin and say hey see bitcoin's totally safe but now they're billionaires because of that infinite printing of money so it's like it i mean they're they're really playing the long game and if i didn't have any morals or scruples i'd be doing that too yeah they i get what i get what you mean they're like pumping the short game while playing the long game and i think i think yeah. if you you look at what um at bitcoin or narratives uh sort of closely enough you'll see that they um they start signaling to value your number of sats like the dollars doesn't um yeah. dollar value doesn't matter like they they the the high time preference thing is just like how many sats do you have just uh make the number of that go up not down because the whole fiat printing thing is like a foregone conclusion and then yeah just to have something to talk about day to day the whole number go up meme is like this is evidence of it happening eventually this is yeah. gonna all flip over and uh, and we have to use sat denomination because there's no way for dollars to make it work anymore and I, and I like that you said signaling because that's all i mean it, it's all just virtue signaling you know to each other yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, it's and, such... if you, and if you don't virtue signal the right way, then you get excommunicated from the from the community. And it's, just like... it's, it's definitely um, a tribal in talk. And and I know that it's not only a Bitcoiner problem, but it's also like just a how we self-organize 
problem. And oh yeah, and yeah. and I don't, I don't know what the solution is to it, other than I take part in a whole bunch of like different permissionless systems. I'm probably like the biggest like try out this chain slut that ever existed on the face of the yeah. earth. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and uh, and you know what? Like um, I'm I'm happy with that level of experimentation. Like it's 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 what I have, like uh, it's exploration that I have a passion for to the point where I will eat shit on a risk that blew up in my face uh, in many different ways. And in search of See, like, I at least, I work. at least can blame the show and say, I'm doing it for the show to educate people. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> That's what I tell myself when I lose like $10,000 on some <laughs> fucking gambling D gen rug pull. Oh, it's Lisa. It's just, it's for the show. It's for the show. I can talk about yeah, it on the show. <laughs> tax write off. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. Oh my God. Oh man. <laughs> uh. Um, I'm gonna have to wrap it up in a, in a few minutes. Is there anything else you would really wanted to like get off your chest about no, politics? No, we've been or we've been all over or... the map. We've been uh, <laughs> we've been keyword. I mean, auto. most shows are like an hour viral. long, but it's like yeah, we'll just let's keep we'll just keep going. Oh no, we we started. We didn't stop. We had the foot on the gas the whole time. It's good. It's a good. It's always good talking to you, man. We burned so much CO2. Bitcoiners would be proud of us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't want to look at the carbon footprint of this conversation, but I have a lot of machines on in front of me right now, and uh, this this mic is pretty big. So, <laughs> well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah. No, thanks so much. It's uh, it's a good talk with you always, and I learn a lot. Well, I mean, don't learn a lot from me. Make sure to make sure to fact check whatever I tell you. I actually I, have I, notes I, that I, I, I'm going to go do some uh, some okay. research now. And I and I'm usually the first person to say like I heard this, <laughs> so <laughs> definitely check to make sure it's it's true. But you know, <laughs> expect an email from me telling you what you were wrong on, yeah. if anything. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, all right. Well. Thanks for listening. I uh, hope you got something out of it. And if you have any questions for Not So Fast, um, why don't you, do, you, do you have uh, ways outside of Twitter to get a hold of you? Twitter is it. All right. So at Not So Fast, all one word. Yeah. And, uh, you know, keep listening, keep doing research, keep being excited by it all. And uh, talk to you next time. Thanks, Michael.